Somewhere in the east of Ukraine, a drab green military truck roars to life and pulls out of its temporary shelter inside some trees. On its back is a single pod of six 227mm rockets. Despite having less power than a traditional multiple rocket launch system, this single truck is the deadliest weapon in the Ukrainian war. The driver clears the trees and the crew gets to work. As the rocket pod lifts up off the bed of the truck on its own and swings to the left, targeting data provided by the US satellites and secret intelligence sources is fed into the firing computer, which in turn programs each rocket with its own impact point. Once ready, a simple press of a button sends six of the big rockets screaming into the sky. As soon as the last rocket clears the launcher, the truck is already on the move. This single piece of rocket artillery provided by the United States is Ukraine's most important weapon and is the single most hunted piece of hardware of the entire war. Russian troops are on the hunt for each and every one of these 16 trucks currently in the nation, and their commanders have been ordered to expend any amount of life required to destroy them. Thus, the trucks are constantly on the move, never staying still in one place for long and always under heavy cover when idle. They pop out of their tree cover or camo netting to fire a salvo, and then immediately retreat to avoid counter-battery fire or an air attack. It's a dangerous game of cat and mouse, but to date, the Ukrainians have been winning to devastating effect. The truck is long gone by the time its rockets find their target. Several dozen miles behind enemy lines, well out of reach of any other artillery, Russian Colonel Andrei Vasilyev, commander of an elite paratrooper regiment, is taking a meeting with his senior officers. To date, Russia has lost a whopping 55 colonels in its half-a-year effort in Ukraine, a casualty figure so staggering, the only parallel is from the Second World War. Thus, Colonel Vasilyev has taken great pains to keep his exact location a secret, but US intelligence has found him and transmitted the GPS coordinates of his secret command post to the Ukrainians. One rocket impacts the command post with a precision of half a meter, instantly incinerating the good colonel and his officers. For him, the war is over. But for those Russians still living, the deadly reign of rockets continues. Supplies and ammunition for artillery pieces is destroyed, as dozens of other soldiers are killed or wounded in the precision strikes. Colonel Andrei Vasilyev is now the 56th Russian colonel to die in Ukraine, but he won't be the last. And a large part of Ukraine's stunning success in recent months is all down to one single gift from the United States, the High Mobility Artillery Rocket System, otherwise known as HIMARS. The impact of HIMARS in Ukraine cannot be understated. While the Javelin has become the patron saint and protector of Ukraine, this American weapon is far deadlier to the Russians than even the Javelin, and that's thanks to its range and precision. With just 12 of these weapon systems in the country, Ukraine has ground the Russian offensive to nearly a complete halt. But how in the world could so few weapons be given Russia so much trouble, and why can't Russia overcome such tiny numbers of US weapons? The HIMARS was developed in the late 1990s for use by the US Army. The system is not much different than any other rocket artillery, save for the fact that instead of the two rocket pods used by the Army's M270 MLRS, HIMARS has only one pod for greatly increased mobility. This allows the system to very quickly move into firing position and then escape before enemy counterbattery fire or a ground attack mission arrives on scene. And it's why Russia is having such a great difficulty neutralizing the dozen units provided to Ukraine. HIMARS can be loaded with a standard six rocket pod or can carry a single tactical ballistic missile with a quick conversion. Its rockets have a range of between 1.2 and 190 miles, or up to 190 miles when using the Army's ATACM surface-to-surface -surface missile. It can even be equipped with a SLAMRAM missile, surface-launched variants of the AMRAM anti-aircraft missile. But its versatility doesn't end there, because unlike any other rocket artillery in the world, HIMARS can even engage targets while loaded up on a transport ship. In October 2017, the US Marine Corps fired a single rocket while at sea from the deck of an amphibious transport dock ship, successfully hitting a shore target with precision. This now makes HIMARS deadly not just on the land, but even when it's still loaded on a ship and waiting to be delivered. The weapon system saw wide use in the Iraq-Afghanistan conflicts, and in a prelude of what was to come if Russia had been paying attention, HIMARS's high precision allowed it to target Taliban commanders' hideouts in October of 2010 forcing them to flee the country temporarily. With its impressive range and precision, HIMARS has fired over 400 rockets at Islamic State militants since November of 2015, and the year after it fired rockets into Syria in support of Syrian rebels there. In January 2016, manufacturer Lockheed Martin announced that HIMARS had reached 1 million operational hours with US forces, achieving an incredible 99% operational readiness rate. 
Compare that with strike fighter aircraft who have been loitering around 70% readiness rate for years, and you can see why HIMARS and its precision fire has become an incredibly important tool for the US Army. And now it's the most important tool in the Ukrainian Army. Russia must have been sleeping through the last decade, because upon making an appearance in Ukraine, HIMARS' impact was immediate, pun intended. The first four units arrived on the 23rd of June, and just two days later, they were in use against Russian forces, killing over 40 Russian soldiers on a precision strike at a military base in Izium. For the first time since the war began, Russian rear areas were under threat from Ukrainian weapons, and the fear this realization struck was palpable, especially as successful fire mission after successful fire mission took place. Within days of its opening salvo, the Russian military said that the US's ML270 MLRS and M142 HIMARS were the most dangerous weapons in Ukraine, and that it was vital for Russian forces to destroy them at any cost. Yet, not all Russian officers were convinced, and it was believed that their air defense units such as the S-300 and S-400 systems would be able to knock the American rockets out of the sky. That, however, never happened, prompting the Russian government to launch an investigation into the manufacturer of the S-300 air defense system, just one of many ongoing investigations into failing or underperforming Russian weapons. For Russian air defense operators, HIMARS rockets fly too fast and too high for their systems to understand them as a threat. They have the flight trajectory of traditional artillery but with the speed of a fighter jet, and this can cause havoc when trying to identify a HIMARS attack. Russian software will need to be patched to begin targeting incoming rockets, a development which could take months to complete, if Russia can manage this feat given all their current difficulties. Any doubt amongst Russian officers as to the deadly efficacy of the HIMARS, however, was ended in the coming weeks, as Ukrainian bombardments targeted Russian command posts and supply depots, inflicting crippling casualties in Russia's command and control networks and destroying over 50 supply depots. On the 4th of July, Ukraine even honored the American independence holiday with help from the Russians with the suspected HIMARS strike against a massive ammo depot. HIMARS has been so effective in countering Russian forces that Ukrainian commanders report that the Russian shelling is down tenfold after successful HIMARS strikes, sparing the lives of hundreds of Ukrainian soldiers. But how in the world could 12 weapons be turning the tide of the war in Ukraine? It has everything to do with precision. Russia has the largest amount of artillery in the world and has come to be called an artillery army, yet the vast majority of that artillery is completely unguided. It is fundamentally the same artillery that was in use since the Second World War. HIMARS, however, is a complete game-changer because it's smart while Russia's artillery is dumb and it has greater range. With its extended range, HIMARS can hit targets well behind the front lines, putting areas normally considered safe from enemy attack at great risk. This means command posts, staging areas, supply depots, and even long-range air defense or ground attack systems, all juicy and very high-value targets that traditional artillery simply cannot reach. With command posts and supplies being forced to relocate further behind battle lines, Russian troops can't move or react as quickly as they once did, slowing down an offensive and limiting the Russian military's ability to exploit battlefield opportunities. Overextension becomes a very real problem and could lead to outright disaster. But the system's real strength comes from precision, because HIMARS can accomplish with one salvo what it takes traditional artillery dozens if not hundreds of rounds to do. And Ukraine is using that precision to great effect by targeting Russian supplies and command posts. This is a strategy in effect since the start of the war, with Ukraine devastating Russian logistics even to the point of ignoring targets such as artillery, troops, or tanks. After all, without fuel and ammo, an army can't fight and Russian forces are discovering that they are having acute supply issues thanks to HIMARS destroying their supply hubs, greatly slowing the pace of their advance and even halting it in places. The use of just 12 HIMARS systems has helped open up a window for a Ukrainian counterattack in the south, which is expected to commence at the end of July, and will probably have started by the time you watch this episode. But precision is worthless if you don't know where the enemy's juiciest targets are, and this is largely where the US comes in. The United States has been feeding vast amounts of intelligence to Ukrainian forces since the start of the conflict, and the US is very good at sniffing out enemy VIPs and other high-priority targets. That's partly thanks to one of the largest intelligence apparatuses in the world, but also thanks to the Russians themselves, who have almost no concept of operational or communication security. A fundamental lack of encrypted radios has allowed Ukraine and the US to snoop on Russian communications and take appropriate action. U.S. intelligence has led to over a dozen Russian generals earning an early and permanent retirement, and with HIMARS on the front lines, that list is only bound to grow. 
The US is committed to keeping Ukraine resupplied with rockets it needs to keep blasting Russian targets and is even shipping additional HIMARS units over the next couple months. Ukraine has said that with 100 of these systems it could push Russia out of its territory and though we don't know how many the US will end up sending to Ukraine, we know that an additional four are already being planned for delivery. For its part, Russia has publicly downplayed the threat that HIMARS poses. Yet, the facts don't lie. Russian use of artillery is down significantly in areas where HIMARS is in play, as Russian artillerymen are forced to conserve ammunition and destruction of the American weapon has become a top priority. Russia claims it has destroyed four of the units to date, a claim that both Ukraine and the Pentagon deny. Now we have news that the US House of Representatives has approved a measure to provide $100 million in funding to train Ukrainian pilots in the use of American F-16s and F-15s. If the bill passes the Senate in September, then Ukrainian pilots could begin training as early as January of next year in US planes. By next summer, Russia could have yet another headache on its hands as it now faces modern American weapons both on the ground and in the sky. The real question is, though, with all its bluster about destroying NATO, how exactly does Russia plan to do that when it can't even handle a dozen US HIMARS? With nearly 400 HIMARS units in service, other NATO members are now requesting the weapon system from the US, which is bad news bears for Vladimir Putin's dreams of Russian expansionism. It's been one year since Russia began its war to defeat Russia by invading Ukraine, and in this time Vladimir Putin has set himself up to become the most catastrophic Russian leader in modern history. This is the ultimate compendium of Russia's failures so far. Russia's failures began before the war started. When planning a military campaign, there are certain steps critical to the planning process. First, one must sort out the internal logistics of a military action. Supply and logistics chains stretching back to the factories that produce your war fighting kit need to be evaluated for robustness in an increased tempo environment. Food and medical supplies need to be stockpiled and pre-staged for rapid distribution. Plans for the ongoing resupply of forces while accounting for battlefield attrition of your logistics force need to be established. The domestic temperature needs to be taken into account. Just how supportive is your population of the war to come? Intelligence assessments of your enemy's capabilities must be conducted. Predictions about the international response to your military action must be made with plans to account for different scenarios. Instead of doing most of this, Putin just said YOLO and sent his tanks to Ukraine. Now, to be fair, there was some preparation for the invasion. Putin tasked his intelligence services with infiltrating Ukraine and taking the temperature, so to speak. In 2014, when Russia annexed Crimea, it did so with significant amounts of local support. It also completely overran a Ukrainian military that was disorganized, inefficient, and untrained as, well, Russia's military today. Because Ukrainian forces for the most part broke and ran, Russian forces never got a chance to truly shine. And by truly shine, we mean show the world and Russia that its military is a bunch of clown shoes. It's easy to be the second best army in the world when nobody's putting up a fight. The details remain unconfirmed, but what is known is that the intelligence reports returning from Ukraine were favorable. The Ukrainian military would hardly put up a fight, and its people would largely welcome Russians as liberators. How in the world anybody believed that last part after Ukraine erupted into violence against its Russian-backed president eight years earlier is beyond any of us here at the infographics office. Very credible rumors have circulated around those intelligence reports with allegations that the operatives tasked with carrying out this operation had in fact pocketed the millions of rubles given to them by Putin and simply made up favorable reports. The rumors remain unverified, but are extremely believable for multiple reasons. First of all, corruption is the name of the game in the Russian military and the government. More on that later. Second, Putin kept his intentions to invade Ukraine secret from all of his most senior staff. At the time of the invasion, the vast majority of the military was completely unaware that it would be crossing into Ukraine. More on that later as well. Thus, it is completely believable that corrupt intelligence officials simply pocketed the money figuring that Putin would never be crazy enough to invade his next-door neighbor. Shortly after the invasion, Sergei Beseda was put on house arrest. By April, he was in prison, his deputy was also placed under house arrest, and rumors are several other intelligence officers had been imprisoned. Not only had Putin's intelligence services, whom were feared globally during the Cold War, misjudged Putin, but they had completely misjudged what little intelligence work they had bothered to do. Thus, it came as a surprise to all when Ukrainians greeted Russian invaders with Kalashnikovs instead of flowers. But the pre-invasion fail train doesn't just stop at this station. Because Putin had kept the invasion secret, 
When the Russian military was mobilized, it did so without taking into account the supply and logistics chains which would need to be pushing hundreds of kilometers into Ukraine. Instead, units were given enough supplies for a few days. Because the Russian military is basically fueled by corruption at every level, we have verified reports from the very eve of the invasion of Russian soldiers selling gasoline and diesel for alcohol and cigarettes to locals. In a professional Western military, you might have been able to keep a cross-border invasion secret without worrying about your soldiers literally selling their own equipment to the nearest taker. But this is Russia. The lack of logistics planning also meant that Russian forces basically had no plan for resupply deep inside of Ukraine. Putin, whom it's important to note has no military background, apparently thinks that food, fuel, and ammo can simply be wished into existence by soldiers on the move. Because while planning his top secret military invasion, he never bothered to have the head of his logistics command in on the planning. The Russian logistics, which are already famously terrible, were caught completely unprepared to support a fully mobilized expeditionary force deep inside enemy territory. And then, suddenly, the GO order was given and nearly 200,000 Russian soldiers realized they were not on exercises. That's when things got really stupid. In 1991, the United States military led an international coalition against one of the largest military forces in the world, the Iraqi army. In a matter of weeks, the Iraqi military was defeated in what is possibly the single most one-sided war in history. Ten years later, the US did it again, and this time with a fraction of the troops and allies. Both times, it absolutely trounced any resistance put up against it through a combination of multi-domain warfare, technological superiority, and very well-trained professional troops, a significant cut above their counterparts. Vladimir Putin saw both US victories and thought, yeah, I can totally do that too. He could not. To be perfectly fair, it's not really Putin's fault he believed his forces were even remotely capable of one-tenth of what the US and NATO could do. Vladimir Putin has ensured his own political survival thanks to a breakout of freak accidents involving political rivals falling out of windows or accidentally running into bullets fired by assassins. Over the years, he's consolidated his grip on power and, like any good dictator, surrounded himself by weak yes-men whom he perpetually pits against each other. By making sure that those around him hate each other more than him, Putin ensures that none of them can gather the support needed to oust him from power. However, this level of extreme corruption has a direct impact on the running of a government. For starters, if you're appointing thoroughly corrupt yes-men to positions of power, you can bet that in order to secure their own power, they're doing that exact same thing under them. This repeats itself on and on down the line, to the point that you have even individual unit commanders whose qualifications are not competency or ability, but loyalty. The real problem comes when it's time to do a self-evaluation, a health checkup if you will, rather than passing along negative news about things like readiness, equipment condition, and troop training, you pass along favorable reports instead. Because after all, any negative reports could be capitalized on by others wanting your position. The last thing your boss wants is to tell his boss something they don't want to hear. It's like a game of telephone, only the original message being passed along is already an outrageous lie. But this culture of corruption bred by Putin is even more insidious, because like an aggressive cancer, it eats the Russian military alive from the inside out. After all, if you are corrupt and stealing public funds, you can bet your Sirnikia that the person under you is doing the same. On and on down the chain to the point that conscript soldiers are tearing the wiring out of combat vehicles so it can be sold for cash under the direct orders of older conscripts who threaten them with beatings if they don't find a way to raise enough cash for them to buy vodka and cigarettes. Those older conscripts naturally are already busy selling grenades and ammunition from the armory. Thus, while Vladimir Putin reviewed readiness reports as he prepared for an invasion, he could hardly be blamed for not knowing his military was an absolute shit show, hardly prepared for basic parade drills, let alone invading another country. Having drunk his own Kool-Aid, Putin gave the go-ahead and even planned his invasion believing he was at the head of the world's second most powerful army. Within hours, it was clear he'd have to fight for the title of most powerful army inside Ukraine. The initial plan was for a lightning strike into Kyiv, with the vaunted Russian paratroopers at the very tip of the spear. They would take key airfields around Kyiv and hold them long enough for Russia to fly in with reinforcements, with an armored thrust south out of Belarus to end mass to the attack. Within three days, the capital and Zelensky's government would both fall. It was a bold, ambitious plan, a lightning operation to make even the United States envy Russia's capabilities, one that would put Putin in the history books. And it did put him in the history books, just not quite how he envisioned it. Operation Fail Hard and Fail Fast began with a preemptive attack on Ukrainian radar and air defense sites and command and control networks. This is always a good idea before any military invasion. It's an even better idea, however, when you have actual up-to-date maps. 
In a turn of events that will surprise absolutely none of you, Russian maps were out of date, with many of them going back to the Soviet era. This meant that many modern installations were unaccounted for, or the maps were inaccurate enough that precision strikes, well, weren't. During the Gulf War, the US famously put a bomb through a ventilation shaft of an Iraqi government building. In February of 2022, Russia was lucky if its missiles were hitting the right city. But to be fair, the initial Russian bombardment succeeded in disrupting the Ukrainian air defense network, though this was largely due to the effect of electromagnetic attack and the fact that Ukraine believed it was facing the second most powerful army in the world. Thus, Ukrainian air defenses quickly moved from their positions in a famous tactic known as don't be where you were when the bombs fall. But whereas the US spent weeks prepping Iraq for invasion the first time and months using special forces and CIA operatives to undermine the Iraqi military and identify targets the second time, the Russian military threw a handful of missiles around Ukraine and called it good enough. This would soon be a disastrous decision. The disruption of Ukraine's air defense network allowed for the insertion of low-flying helicopters carrying hundreds of soon-to-be corpses. The Russian VDV, or paratroopers, are Russia's most elite troops so celebrated that they even have their own official holiday. No news on what 2023's festivities will look like, considering many of them are now dead. The paratroopers were dispatched to airfields outside of Kyiv, where supported by attack helicopters and a few combat jets, overwhelmed the initial defenders. The plan was going swimmingly. Reinforcements were loading up onto transport jets, and the VDV had its first actual military victory against a conventional foe since World War II. However, within 48 hours, the VDV would go from proudly displaying the might of Russia's airborne forces on hostile soil to being turned into roadkill. We're not kidding either. According to Georgian Legion commander Mamuka Mamulashvili, when he ran out of ammo he got into a car and pursued the fleeing Russian paratroopers running several over. The plan to take Kyiv in three days had failed, and the war would turn into a catastrophe for Russia. But what went wrong? We all know Russia underestimated Ukraine, but the level of underestimation goes past simple our intelligence was bad slash we didn't do any intelligence work all the way to pure arrogance. Without a preparatory bombardment on the Ukrainian air defense network before the invasion, the nation's air defense units were quickly back on the job. This immediately shut down the airspace around Kyiv to the Russian air forces, preventing them from supporting the airborne forces with close air support. And they needed that air support badly because they were up shit creek with no paddle. The initial defenders at Antonov and Hostomel airports were largely conscripts and easily overrun. However, within hours, Ukrainian special forces and regular mechanized infantry responded to the assault. This was never supposed to happen. Prior to the invasion, Russia had slipped multiple units of Spechnaz into Kyiv. Their mission was twofold, eliminate the Zelensky government and sow chaos amongst the defenders of the city. As the most elite of elite forces in the Russian military, the Spetsnaz were more than up for the task. Or so you would think, if like most Russians you'd been on a steady diet of copium since the end of the Cold War. Details here are incredibly scarce and likely will never be fully known until long after the end of the war. What is known, however, is that these units failed catastrophically at their job. There are multiple reports of mob justice against Russian special forces, and the details are too grim to post on YouTube. Suffice to say, Ukraine's own special forces and even civilians had a lot to say about the Spetsnaz plan. Over at Hostomel Airport, not only did Russia suffer the losses of multiple helicopters to ground fire, but once they managed to land, Ukrainian artillery devastated the airborne troopers. In a regular competent military, this would never happen, or would quickly be neutralized by overhead air support. However, not only did Russia not bother with a preparatory air campaign, but aside from the helicopters, its ability to provide air support to ground forces is limited, at least with any form of precision. Few Russian pilots are even trained for a ground support role, and just as few Russian planes have the required targeting pods for it. Lack of training is hardly surprising, considering that Russian pilots have been struggling to get 60 hours of flight time a year, while US pilots are getting an average of 120, and this is considered dangerously low for the Air Force. With air support shut out of the sky by Ukrainian air defenses and the plan to fly in reinforcements untenable, the paratroopers were forced to retreat and launch a new assault with the aid of the forces pushing south out of Belarus. Unfortunately, the lack of logistics planning and a series of Ukrainian ambushes severely limited the capabilities of the ground force. Ultimately, the attack would fail and Kyiv stood. Military historian Frederick Kagan of the Institute for the Study of War would refer to the failure as stunning after citing that he knows of no parallel to a major military power invading a country at a time of its own choosing and failing so utterly. The assault on Kyiv was a complete disaster, but a lack of logistics planning in the basic terrible state of the Russian military itself would lead to one of the most embarrassing moments in modern warfare. 
Ukrainian defenders bravely fought off Russia's attacks on Kyiv, and Putin responded by pouring even more forces and armored vehicles into the battle. However, now the Achilles heel of the Russian military would be put on full display. And we're gonna have to be way more specific because the Russian military has not one, but at least a dozen points of failure. Remember how we mentioned that Putin launched his invasion without consulting his logistics chiefs and how Russian troops had no idea they were about to invade Ukraine? Well, left to his own devices, Private Conscriptovich sold off as much fuel and food as possible to the Belarusian citizens, and without resupply worked out, the massive armored convoy heading to Kyiv just sorta of stalled out. The images were absolutely shocking. 40 miles of tanks, armored personnel carriers, mobile air defenses, and supply trucks all ground to a complete halt. It was reminiscent of the Iraqi mass exodus from Kuwait during the Gulf War, where thousands of vehicles attempted to flee the Allied assault. Only this convoy hadn't been brought to a stop by overwhelming air power, instead the Russian convoy had been brought to a standstill by good old-fashioned Russian incompetence, just like Uncle Stalin used to make. A lack of fuel meant diesel-hungry armored vehicles were forced to pull over to the side of the road, but the fuel trucks couldn't reach them because other armored vehicles were waiting for their turn to go. Having set up no staging or resupply areas, a few traffic snarls soon added up to the full-body paralysis of the entire affair. For Ukrainian infantry armed with Western anti-tank weapons, it was like shooting fish in a very, very tiny barrel. And because vehicles like tanks can't just turn their engines on and ride off into combat when the enemy shows up, they were forced to keep their engines idling for hours, resulting in even more vehicles running out of gas. If Ukraine had a fraction of the air power of even a modestly sized NATO power such as Spain, Russia would have faced catastrophic loss of combat power on the highway to Kyiv, reminiscent of the 2,000 or so vehicles Iraq lost on the highway of death in 1991. Instead, Ukraine used Turkish-made drones to exact painful losses on the stalled-out vehicles, which in itself is an absolutely absurd turn of events. Bayraktar drones are not stealthy, and while they might be low observable, they are easily detected at range by modern air defense radars. Despite this, we have multiple videos of Bayraktars taking out Russian air defense vehicles, and the reason why takes the absolute cake for stupidity. And that's a very tough competition given the fact that the Russian military is basically fueled by stupid. Modern short and medium range air defense systems were getting blown to bits by simple Bayraktar drones because their operators never turned on their air defense radars. Despite being stalled out and vulnerable to air attack, Russian air defense operators largely failed to defend from air attacks. But even more perplexing, the Russian Air Force itself did not provide air cover for the massively vulnerable convoy that was quickly becoming missile bait for Ukrainian drones. Multiple reasons why this happened have been proposed, ranging from a lack of fuel forcing the vehicles to shut down to simple incompetence from an overwhelmingly conscript force. However, recently it's been revealed that the biggest reason Russian air defense operators weren't defending the convoy from simple drone attacks is because they were jammed by the Russian military. Its electromagnetic warfare campaign to shut down Ukrainian air defenses, resulting in fratricidal jamming across many parts of both fronts, which meant that while Ukrainian air defenses were having trouble engaging Russian planes, the same was true for Russian air defenses. So, Ukraine switched to using simple and cheap drones to leisurely hunt for Russian vehicles and traded inexpensive dumb bombs for multi-million dollar assets. But the disaster was far from over. Because as the convoy was forced to slowly, painfully retreat, it was forced to leave many of its vehicles behind, and the world would finally get a good close-up look at one of the leading causes for the failure of the world's second most powerful army, tires. I don't know if you know this, tires are important. If you don't believe us, just try driving your car without them. But military tires are even more important, mostly because they're responsible for the mobility of vehicles worth up to tens of millions of dollars. To make sure that tires are up for the task of keeping heavy and often very armored vehicles running, manufacturers put them through a variety of tests, including x-ray imaging to detect defects. But these high-quality tires are expensive, and if you're a corrupt logistics officer in the Russian military, that's money that could be better spent on babushkas and vodka. As the convoy retreated, dozens upon dozens of vehicles were discovered to be pushed to the side of the road. These vehicles were completely undamaged and had tanks full of fuel, but the tires had burst. A quick investigation revealed that the Russian military was using cheap Chinese tires that were not rated for military vehicles, and in the muddy terrain the tires had failed. However, other vehicles showed signs of something even more shocking. They were equipped with tires over 30 years old, dating back to the USSR. But Russia wasn't using just cheap or ancient tires, they were failing at the most basic task of military maintenance. When kept in storage, vehicles are regularly started up and turned around. 
This prevents one side of the vehicle from being constantly exposed to the sun and thus prevents tire rot. Evidence shows that Russian vehicles were thrown into motor pools and then just left there to bake in the sun for months, possibly even years on end. This tire controversy would have been deeply embarrassing for any professional military, but for Russia, it was just business as usual. You know your failed power when bad tires cause you to abandon a $10 million air defense vehicle in perfect working order. That's okay though, it obviously wasn't doing the Russians much good anyway, so better let the Ukrainians put it to good use. The absolute comedy of errors that was the Russian assault on Kyiv basically ended all credibility the Russian military had as the world's second most powerful army. At the heart of its failure was a logistics system that had been bad since the days of the Soviet Union though. Most of you are probably familiar with the humble wooden pallet. Pallets allow you to efficiently stack and transport goods. But the Russian military is not just at war with Ukraine, it's at war with efficiency. Thus, while the entire modern world is using pallets and forklifts to quickly move goods around, Russia relies on the ancient technique of loading a bunch of shit in your arms and moving it from place to place. But logistics problems don't just stop there for Russia, because since the days of the Soviet Union, Russia has relied on rail transportation to move supplies from place to place. On the one hand, railroads are incredibly efficient ways to move lots of goods quickly. On the other hand, railroads are notoriously inefficient at going places where no railroads actually exist. Compared to their western counterparts, the Soviets, and now the Russians, have less than half the logistics personnel and trucks of a similar sized unit. Thus, when planning an offensive into NATO territory, the Soviets relied on capturing western locomotives as their own locomotives couldn't operate on western gauge railroads. For any military geniuses in the audience, you probably already spotted a flaw in the plan. Everyone else who's not a military genius or a Soviet military planner has probably also spotted a flaw in that plan. NATO militaries being fully aware that Russian locomotives couldn't ride on western tracks would never allow their own locomotives to fall into Soviet hands. Soviet idiocy aside, modern Russians at least enjoyed the benefit of Ukraine still using Soviet-gauged railroad. However, the Ukrainians thought about that, which is why they blew up as much of their railroad as they could. The Russians, who apparently did not realize railroads weren't immune to explosions, were thus forced to use trucks to move supplies from safe bases in Belarus to Ukraine itself. Given that the Russian military lacks enough vehicles to fully resupply units, the further from safe logistics hubs Russian forces went during their travel toward Kyiv, the longer it took to deliver an already insufficient amount of supplies. The end result was a cascading state of fail that crippled any advance toward Kyiv, only made worse by the fact that Ukraine quickly changed its strategy from blowing up Russian armored vehicles to just blowing up Russian trucks. Soon the Russians were forced to press civilian vans and trucks into service, though it wouldn't be enough to save them. But the Russian Navy would soon do its best to catch up to the incredible amount of failure exhibited by the Russian Army and Air Force. At first, things in the Black Sea were going pretty good for Russia, and then they weren't. The Moskva, flagship of the Russian Black Sea Fleet, a Slava-class guided missile cruiser and one of the few parts of the Russian Navy considered a legitimate threat to NATO forces until suddenly it wasn't. On the 13th of April, the Moskva was sailing south of Odessa when it spotted a Bayraktar drone with its air defense radar. As the ship responsible for fleet air defense, this was of little surprise. What was surprising was the two Neptune anti-ship missiles which slammed into the port side of the Moskva. Twelve hours later, the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet was now an artificial reef. Confusion reigns over the attack on the Moskva, with Ukraine and the United States both remaining tight-lipped. What is known is that the US provided intelligence directly leading to the attack on the Moskva. What is not known is how the attack succeeded in the first place. As a fleet air defense vessel, the Moskva's primary purpose was to prevent such an attack from occurring in the first place. The ship was equipped with a triple-layer air defense system that would have given it up to four minutes of warning for the incoming missiles. Claims that a Bayraktar drone had been used to distract the Moskva are invalid, as the ship should have been easily capable of tracking multiple airborne targets. Since the sinking, a maintenance report from the Moskva had surfaced online, indicating the ship was in dire need of repair. This report is unsubstantiated, though given what we've learned about the state of repair of Russian weapon systems, it's not impossible that the Moskva was simply in such bad shape it couldn't even defend itself. Russian conscripts also made up a significant part of the Moskva crew, and it's possible that poorly trained conscripts simply didn't know how to respond to the situation. Other wilder theories claim that NATO special forces attached limpet mines to the hull of the ship, but given how shy NATO's been about giving assistance to Ukraine, this is unlikely in the extreme. The facts of the matter hint at a catastrophic flaw in Russian naval warships. Since the sinking of the Moskva, the entire Russian Black Sea fleet has not strayed far from safe harbor, in effect ceding the Black Sea to an enemy without a navy. 
as two Neptune anti-ship missiles should have never been able to cause catastrophic enough damage to sink a ship the size of the Moskva. It's strongly suspected that Russian ships suffer from a serious design flaw that makes them floating coffins. It would certainly explain why the Russian Navy's been demoted to lobbing long-range missiles from the safety of friendly waters. From the Black Sea, we now go to the east of Ukraine, because if you thought Russian stupidity had reached its zenith north of Kyiv, you severely underestimated Russian stupidity. In the east of the country, Russia fared much better against Ukraine thanks to the fact that most of the east is relatively flat rolling plains. This is perfect for Russia's vast fleet of armored vehicles, which was one of its biggest advantages over Ukraine. However, Russia would very quickly do its best to level the playing field by what can now only be described as industrial-grade, weaponized, concentrated, stupid. Rivers are the only real natural obstacles in the east of Ukraine, and for a military force, rivers are historically a difficult challenge. We're not here to trash Russia for having difficulty crossing a river. Moving large amounts of armored vehicles and troops over deep water is a dicey proposition in the best of times, let alone when someone else is trying to kill you. But Russia came up with a novel way of crossing the Donetsk River. Instead of using traditional pontoons, it apparently attempted to fill the river with armored vehicles so the rest of its army could just drive over the top of them. At least that's the best explanation we have as to what occurred outside of Bilohorivka. After spotting a Russian bridging effort, Ukrainian forces allowed armored vehicles to cross before pounding it with artillery. The crossing was then repeated, right next to the original crossing, which had been sighted in by the Ukrainian artillery. To no one's surprise, this crossing, too, was also pounded to oblivion. At this point, Russian forces retreated to rethink their plan to cross the Donets. Just kidding, they tried at least two more times in adjacent locations. The attempt to cross the Donets River resulted in the estimated loss of two battalion tactical groups and remains the deadliest engagement of the war for Russian forces. Even pro-Russian military bloggers would lash out at the Russian Ministry of Defense, with some calling it outright sabotage. Even internet tough guy and pro-Russian mill blogger Yuri Podolyaka commented that the disaster was due to the, quote, stupidity of the Russian command. However, the Russian aerospace forces will not tolerate any competition for the title of dumbest branch of the Russian military. Russian military doctrine states that rotary aviation needs to be able to respond to requests for fire support within 15 minutes. This necessarily means that helicopters must be stationed closer to the front line than fixed-wing aircraft. However, this very quickly breaks down into aggressive levels of stupidity, and nowhere was this on fuller display than in Chornobaevka. In total, Ukraine shelled the airfield at Chornobaevka an estimated 30 times, destroying and damaging dozens of Russian helicopters. After every single attack, the Russian military simply brought the helicopters back. The Russian attempt to defeat Ukrainian artillery shells with helicopters met with little success, and Ukrainian artillery won the day. It was in effect the most insane game of whack-a-mole, only the mole absolutely refused to go back down into the hole. But this was far from the Russian aerospace force's greatest follies of the war. As Russia gradually realized that Ukraine wasn't capitulating and, oh crap, it's actually fighting back pretty effectively, it started throwing planes at the problem. And those planes were getting shot down, so Russia swapped to night operations and low flying. This was effective in preventing both Ukrainian air defense batteries from engaging them and Ukrainian soldiers armed with man pads from spotting incoming attack jets. However, if you're going to be running night operations, then you should probably have aircraft capable of doing so and pilots trained in them. You can already guess what's coming next. Russia did not, in fact, have an air fleet capable of night operations. Only a small portion of its attack jets could carry out night attacks, and significantly lacking in precision weapons, all its night campaign ended up doing is creating very large and expensive holes in Ukrainian fields. In about a week, Russia was back to daytime operations, but this time from far behind friendly lines so as to not risk getting blown out of the sky by Ukrainian defenses. This has forced Russia to use up almost all of its entire stock of long-range attack weapons, including hypersonic weapons, which in the words of one Western analyst is, quote, insanely disproportionate value for the cost, especially when you consider most of these attacks were against civilian infrastructure and had no military value. The mystery of the missing Russian Air Force is, however, probably best solved by the simple fact that Russia is incompetent and can't de-conflict its own airspace. Numerous very high-profile incidents of friendly fire resulted in Russian air defense units shooting down their own jets. In the initial stages of the invasion, this was especially problematic, with the Russian ground forces doing more to defeat the Russian air forces than Ukraine. Since then, the situation hasn't greatly improved, forcing Russia to use its air forces very sparingly and very carefully so as to avoid having them blown up by their own assets. 
This is what happens when you don't train your military properly and when the exercises you do put on are highly scripted. For context, during Desert Storm, Allied forces had approximately 4,000 aircraft operating in Iraqi airspace and suffered only a handful of blue-on-blue -blue incidents. Russia, meanwhile, is operating an estimated 350 aircraft across the airspace, twice the size of Iraq. To say Russia is utterly incompetent would be to call the ocean wet. Another one of Russia's biggest fails during its campaign in Ukraine is its inability to contend with modern weapon systems. When HIMARS arrived on the scene, it had an outsized impact on the Russian military. Despite Ukraine having barely a dozen of the weapon system, HIMARS single-handedly changed the course of the war by destroying Russian command and control nodes and supply depots close to the front lines. Historically, Russia's waged wars against vastly inferior powers, so it can hardly be blamed for being surprised by the use of precision weapons. Except Russia has long droned on and on and on about how it was more than a match for NATO, which means it should have been ready for NATO weapons in Ukrainian hands. It was not. Instead, the entire Russian military was put on its back foot by a tiny amount of NATO weapons. The precision HIMARS strikes forced Russia to retire many senior officers prematurely by burying them in graves. It also forced them to move their supply depots even further back from the front lines. Remember earlier how we talked about the terrible Russian logistics and their lack of trucks? Well, the same problem that appeared north of Kyiv once more reared its ugly head as the pace of Russian resupply was slowed to a crawl. This effectively stopped the Russian offensive in the east of the country and allowed Ukraine to begin to use its new NATO toys to shape the battlefield for a stunningly successful offensive to come. We're not going to talk too much about the offensive except to say this. Russia's First Guards Tank Army, the very force which was meant to take on and defeat NATO's best defenses, got wrecked by a patchwork Ukrainian force equipped with Cold War-era tanks. This was the nail in the coffin for any pro-Russian bots claiming that Russia's setbacks were due to the fact that it was not committing its best forces and holding them in reserve until Ukraine exhausted itself. By the culmination of the Ukrainian offensive, Russia should have been accustomed to the use of precision weapons. Apparently, though, Russia learned nothing because on New Year's Eve, one of the most explosive moments of the war, pun intended, rocked the entire nation of Russia. Shortly after midnight, HIMARS rockets rained down on a vocational school in Russian-controlled Makivka in the Donetsk region. The school had been used as a temporary barracks for over 500 fresh Russian conscripts. As if that wasn't bad enough, some genius Russian officer also decided to use the same building to house ammunition because Russia really is its own worst enemy. The soldiers had been warned about using their cell phones but naturally ignored their order and had been sending text messages and phone calls home to wish Happy New Year's to families and loved ones. Ukraine triangulated the electronic activity and sent its own warm wishes to the tune of an estimated 400 dead. Though to be fair, this number would have been far lower if Russian leadership hadn't decided to stuff the basement full of high explosive ammunition. This would be a sign of things to come in the new year. As the temperature plummeted, it soon became clear Russia had not prepared for a winter campaign. Its feared winter offensive never materialized, and its troops were documented begging on social media for basic supplies. The Russian mechanized forces became thinner and thinner on the ground and eventually disappeared altogether, leading to foot assaults against Ukrainian trenches in the style of World War I with similar results. The lack of Russian armored vehicles is best explained by disasters such as the infamous Battle of Volodar. In Chornobyvka, the Russian military attempted to defeat Ukrainian artillery shells with parked helicopters. In Volodar, it was now time to defeat Ukrainian anti-tank missiles and mines with tanks. With the town heavily fortified and surrounded by minefields, the Russians were quick to discover several lanes clear of mines. To their credit, the Russians realized this was a trap and attempted to use engineers to clear their own lanes through the minefields. However, Ukrainian artillery quickly put a stop to that. Naturally, Russia simply yelled YOLO and poured its tanks and infantry into the very obviously trapped lanes free of mines. To no one's surprise, not even the Russians, their advances into Volodar ran straight into Ukrainian ambushes. To the surprise of no one again, especially the Russians, after several crushing defeats, the Russians simply tried it again, and again, and again, and again, and one more time after that, and then a few more times after that one. We don't know how many losses Ukraine suffered, but we do know that Russia lost around 120 armored vehicles in what's become known as the biggest tank battle of the war. Except Russia was facing very few Ukrainian tanks and mostly just running into minefields, anti-tank infantry, and pre-sighted artillery. Finally, after completely exhausting their available armor, Russia retreated from Volodar. The Russian commander in charge of the battle would be promoted for his glorious contribution to the motherland, because in Russia you don't fix stupid, you aggressively reinforce it.
By the time you see this video, the Ukraine spring or summer offensive should have begun. But the question on everyone's lips for the last six months of the war has been, what's next? There's a tendency to think that everything hinges on the coming offensive, but the truth is, no matter what happens, the war is unlikely to end this year. While most people hope the coming offensive is successful, even a complete failure won't be enough to end Ukraine's military resistance. And barring a complete internal collapse of the Russian military, another route similar to that suffered in the fall of 2022 also won't be enough to end Russian occupation. In preparation for this offensive, Ukraine has pulled an unknown but significant amount of troops from the front lines. This is why for months there has been little movement on the front, as tens of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers, artillerymen, and tankers were all pulled to the rear areas or sent out of the country to train for the coming offensive. Famously, a month ago, a video was released of British soldiers providing an honor guard for departing Ukrainian soldiers who had just wrapped up months of training. The UK, Poland, and other NATO nations have been hosting Ukrainian crews training for the coming offensive. Accelerated training on the Leopard 2 tank has been a priority, but training on new 155mm howitzers, multiple launch rocket systems, and Patriot air defense systems have all been ongoing for months. A vanguard force of an unknown number has been training under NATO instruction for months, with the UK, Finland, New Zealand, Canada, the US, the Netherlands, Denmark, and the Baltic countries all sending instructors to help prepare the troops for the task to come. Ukraine has opted to fight a defensive war through the winter of 2022 into the spring of this year, making almost no new gains and simply holding what it took back in the fall. But this was a big gamble, with tens of thousands of troops pulled off their front lines for specialist training. Ukraine has invested big into the coming offensive, and luckily for it, its frontline troops have largely held their positions against the Russian onslaught. The Battle of Bakhmut, which has now been raging for 10 months, has been a strategic boondoggle for the Russians and absolute godsend to the Ukrainians. Many have criticized Ukraine for holding a strategically worthless city, even as they criticized the Russians for expending as many as 100,000 men attempting to take it over the better part of a year. News reports ran stories for months of U.S. generals advising the Ukrainians to pull out and of President and Zelensky refusing to. However, it's only now that we've learned just how devastating a toll Ukraine has exacted on Russia for a completely strategically worthless village, with an estimated 100,000 dead and wounded in this one battle alone. Ukraine has suffered as well, though its estimates are far lower given that they were on the defense, with about 15,000 to 20,000 killed, and all has not gone according to plan. Through intense pressure and the sacrifice of thousands of Wagner prisoner recruits used in human wave attacks, Russia has managed to close the vice around Bakhmut while taking a huge toll on Ukrainian forces. The situation was so dire that Ukraine was forced to pull some of its elite special forces training for the coming offensive to reinforce Bakhmut and beat back a Russian flanking attack. These were forces that Ukraine was hoping to keep fresh and fighting fit to be used when it came time to attack, and it was forced instead to dedicate them to Bakhmut or suffer an encirclement. But Bakhmut has served to focus Russian efforts across the east, allowing Ukraine to concentrate defenses there and freeing up its best forces to undergo months of training. While it's been a meat grinder for both sides, history will almost certainly prove Ukraine the winner, if simply because it managed to completely exhaust Russian forces over months of fighting. And even now, reports from Bakhmut are coming in which might hint at what's to come. Early in May, Wagner Group's Prigozhin warned that due to the Russian Ministry of Defense cutting off his troops from supplies, he was going to pull out of his positions. For months now, the Russian MOD has played a cat and mouse game with Prigozhin, with neither side having much love for the other. It all comes down to a rivalry between Prigozhin and his private military company and the Minister of Defense Sergei Shoigu and the Russian military he oversees. Putin has kept both jostling for his favor at each other's throats, the way any good dictator sows chaos amongst his subordinates to prevent them from banding together against him. But the personal drama has led to open firefights between the two groups and now a supply embargo, leaving Wagner forces without ammunition or shells needed to keep fighting. There is a strong possibility that Shoigu had purposely cut Wagner off right before the PMC took the whole of Bakhmut, as now Ukraine is hanging on to only the very western outskirts of it. Perhaps Shoigu wishes to take Bakhmut with a regular Russian military in order to deny Prigozhin the prize he's been fighting over for nearly a year. This would not be unheard of, given that the Russian MOD took credit for the capture of Soledar earlier this year, despite it having been Wagner who did most of the fighting. The move drew a litany of protests from Prigozhin, who began to openly criticize the MOD and Shoigu himself via social media in what would be tantamount to sedition in any other government. 
Indeed, the Russian army, which holds the flanks around Bakhmut, have been making slow gains in an attempted encirclement. If they were to succeed and close the pincer around Bakhmut, the army could claim victory and once more leave Prigozhin out in the cold. Prigozhin might have seen this coming, as he's now announced that he was considering pulling Wagner out of the war completely multiple times, with the most recent threat to drawing condemnation from Russian generals who said that Wagner abandoning his positions would be punishable as treason. Prigozhin warned that on May 10th he would leave his positions unless his forces were immediately resupplied. Taking the threat seriously, the Russian army opened up its stockpiles, then promptly shut them back up again, prompting a new round of protests on May 9th. This infighting may be what decides how the war plays out next. Russian regular forces may be attempting to close the vice on Bakhmut, but on May 8th the news broke that the Russians were in retreat across parts of the southern sector as Ukraine forces counterattacked. While since there's been no sign that this was the promised theater-wide counterattack, it's speculated that Russian forces might have feared it was. They've known for months that Ukraine was massing for a counterattack, and remember the massive rout suffered in the north and the fall of Kherson. Western influence and psyops have also been targeting Russians both at home and on the front, and there's speculation that at least some Russian troops may have been breaking and running from fear of being caught up in a massive attack powered by Western tanks and infantry fighting vehicles. The gains have been small, but they have effectively stopped any attempt to surround Bakhmut and brought the few thousand Ukrainians still defending the city a bit more breathing room. However, the breaking and running of Russian troops could be emblematic of just how poorly Russian forces are prepared for the coming offensive. Ukraine has not been the only one preparing for a coming attack. Russia too has been doing what it could to prepare to defend what it's taken. Miles upon miles of trenches, dragon's teeth, and minefields have been laid out to stop or slow Ukrainian attacks. Leaked intelligence shows the Russians have also been organizing special task forces to take on Western tanks when they make their appearance. And this might be the smartest thing Russia has done all war, which is setting a pretty low bar. The world is waiting with bated breath to see Ukraine attack Russian forces with Western Leopard 2s, Bradley IFVs, and eventually Abrams' main battle tanks. Much has been made about the capabilities of these vehicles versus their Russian counterparts, and for the most part the assessments are true. This has created a sort of global hype though, and Ukraine won't just be fighting for its territory when it throws Western tanks into the battle, it'll be fighting for public support. Russia knows many Westerners oppose the sending of tanks and heavy IFVs, and they have expended great efforts to scare the West into ceasing armed supplies to Ukraine via threats of nukes and other fantastical terror scenarios. If Russia can use special task forces to destroy Ukrainian-operated Western tanks, it could prove to many in the West that it's fruitless to continue sending large amounts of very expensive equipment. Likewise, Russia also knows that its own troops are scared shitless of the capabilities of Western equipment, and destroying dozens of Leopard 2s could do miracles for the ever-dwindling Russian morale. Likewise, runaway success for Ukraine on the backs of American Bradleys and German Leopard 2s could turn Russia's significant morale problem into a full-blown crisis. There's few Russians who don't remember the performance of Western hardware against the same Soviet equipment they're now operating in Desert Storm. Russia's military is simply too large to be defeated in a single, even wildly successful counterattack. But a morale crisis could spell the doom of Russia's war efforts. It's happened before, with massive mutinies rocking the Russian imperial military in World War I and leading to revolution. Putin's special Western tank killer forces might not be fighting for the future of the war, but for Putin's personal future as well. Ukraine has been well equipped for the coming battle, including American M58 Miklix for handling Russian minefields. These mine-clearing charges shoot out a line of explosives a few hundred meters long, then detonate to create a clear lane for tanks to advance. Ukraine has also been provided with the engineering vehicles necessary to clear paths for heavy vehicles through thick Russian minefields and destroy Dragon's Teeth and other anti-tank fortifications. America's most senior generals have commented that they are satisfied that Ukraine has all it needs for the coming offensive. In all likelihood, the offensive will take place near Zaporizhia, as Ukraine's best move would be to punch through the middle of Russian lines in order to reach Mariupol and sever Russia's southern forces from resupply. However, recently Ukraine has been fighting small skirmishes along islands on the Dnipro, pushing Russian forces off of them. A nationwide call for life vests and small boats has led to many speculating that Ukraine might surprise everyone and launch an offensive directly across the Dnipro. However, it's incredibly unlikely Ukraine would opt to do this as it would be very difficult to move heavy equipment across the river. Russian sources have speculated that Ukraine may attack in the north and into Russia itself taking Belgorod, prompting a small panic in the Russian border region. However, this is incredibly unlikely, as President Zelensky has repeatedly stated he has no plan to take even an inch of Russian territory. This is also unlikely because doing so would seriously anger Ukraine's NATO partners, who don't want to give Russia any reason to escalate the war to the nuclear threshold. 
It would also sour the opinion of some in the West, and public opinion is all important to the continued resupply of Ukrainian forces. And resupply is the name of the game, because barring a miracle, Ukraine's coming offensive won't end the war. Instead, it'll eat up massive amounts of equipment, which will all need to be replaced by Western nations. And this is Ukraine's major advantage over Russia. Russia has the manpower, but it has very little metal. Ukraine, meanwhile, has been building large amounts of metal via donated Western vehicles. But it isn't enough, and what has been pledged needs to be immediately resupplied, because no matter how good Leopard 2s and Abrams are, they will be lost in combat. Russia still retains the air advantage, and tanks are notoriously allergic to air attack. If Ukraine fatigue sets in, the nation could see the supply of Western equipment drying up, and there is no doubt that despite the heroism and ingenuity of Ukraine's defenders, they would have been defeated long ago without Western weapons, financial support, and intelligence. At this moment, it's a race between Ukraine and Russia. One side is building a massive manpower pool, and the other is trying to equip a far smaller pool with far more advanced weapons. Without the West and the support of its populations, Ukraine will lose this race and the war. Luckily, the current U.S. President Joe Biden has reaffirmed his long-term support for Ukraine, with yet another $1.2 billion aid package being recently announced. And this package is a spicy one. Amongst the announced aid is much more 155mm artillery rounds, which U.S. factories have been expanding their capability to produce at breakneck speeds. Also included are more air defense systems, though the exact nature of which are unannounced so as to deny Russia critical intelligence. However, educated guesses point to more Patriot and NASAMS batteries as well as stinger systems for foot soldiers. Also included are more and new radars and missiles. But perhaps most importantly is funds dedicated to figuring out how to integrate Ukraine's Soviet-era kit with modern American weapons. Ukraine has a lot of Soviet kit, and there's simply no ammo for it. American agents have been scouring the world for every available S-300 missile they could get to feed Ukraine's air defense batteries, but inevitably they've been coming up short as global stocks from friendly nations dwindle out. Yet the S-300 systems remain fully operational, they just have nothing to shoot. This is where a US-led effort to integrate these systems with modern US munitions comes in. Because if a workaround can be found to integrate missiles such as Patriot interceptors or SM-3s or SM-6s with Ukraine's Soviet kit, then that's significantly cheaper than having to provide entire air defense systems, and it would dramatically improve Ukraine's capabilities. There's some precedent for success, with some very clever American engineers figuring out how to jerry-rig US harm missiles into Ukrainian MiGs. However, it wasn't possible to make the two systems fully compatible, limiting the effectiveness of the American-made anti-radiation missiles. Something is better than nothing, though, and Ukraine put its harm missiles to fantastic use even in their limited capacity, seriously degrading Russian air defense radar coverage and artillery counter-battery radar. What's got everyone talking, though, is an unspecified amount of quote, classified aid. This has set the rumor mill ablaze, because there's a lot of very fancy US kit that Ukraine could put to great use liberating Russians from their lives. Some have predicted that this would end up being the Attackums missiles that Ukraine's been asking for, but that's unlikely as President Biden has been stubbornly refusing to provide that weapon. This hasn't stopped the UK, who is seeking a way to crowdsource with other nations the cost of purchasing Storm Shadow long-range attack missiles for Ukraine. With a range of up to 300 kilometers, Storm Shadow missiles can be fired from Ukrainian jets with no problem and would put targets that Ukrainian HIMARS can't reach at risk, leveling the playing field significantly. There is speculation that part of the classified aid could be the American El Rassams, its latest generation of long-range anti-ship missiles. These stealthy missiles take a dramatically different approach to the new generation of Russian and Chinese anti-ship missiles. Instead of flying incredibly fast, they fly at subsonic speeds with an internal jet engine. But where they have the advantage is in their stealthy design and advanced artificial intelligence. The actual detection range of an El Rassam is classified, but they have the capability of significantly reducing engagement time for surface ships dramatically improving the odds of a hit. El Rassams can be fired from either planes, ships, or even ground canisters. It's unlikely that they're compatible with Ukrainian jets, but with a range in excess of 300 nautical miles, El Rassams launched from Odessa would reach Russian ships almost anywhere in the Black Sea. And sinking the Russian Black Sea fleet is a priority for Ukraine, as it's those same ships Russia's been using to launch volleys of cruise missiles against civilians. While the Russian Navy is too terrified to leave port, their ships still make great launch platforms for long-range missiles. Sinking these ships would severely limit limit Russia's ability to launch cruise missile strikes, but it would also inflict devastating financial cost to Russia. NATO is keenly interested in seeing the Russian Black Sea fleet turn into the Russian Black Sea Marine Preserve. 
as it would end Russia's days as a naval power in the region. Thus, while remote, the possibility of El Rasms being provided to Ukraine is not zero, but one weapon could define the war to come even more than Western tanks, F-16s. Ukraine's been asking for Western F-16s since the war began, and the West has been reluctant to provide them. The issue is complicated. As Russian air defenses remain formidable across the front, the F-16s would have a tough time operating with such dense air defenses. For its part, Ukraine wants a way of knocking Russian bombers and fighters out of the sky and help to keep its troops safe from air attack. Without some significant development on the battlefield, though, it's unlikely F-16s are the best option at the moment, and thus the U.S. has been reluctant to provide them. You don't need me to tell you that misinformation in the news is at an all-time high, especially when it comes to topics with huge global implications like the conflict in Ukraine. One of the hardest parts about researching topics, like today's video on weapons the US is sending to Ukraine, is being able to find sources untainted by bias or by their own financial motivations, which is why I've started using Ground News. Ground News is the world's first news comparison platform, and I mean that you can literally compare news, like with this article about the US shipping weapons stored in Israel to Ukraine, where you can see that the headlines are subtly different depending on the outlet. With right-leaning sources using terms like quietly shipping or secret stockpile, while left-leaning ones make no mention of it being quiet or a secret. You also get a breakdown of what type of news sources are covering a story, making it easier to spot media biases, like how that same story about stockpiles of weapons in Israel has a 57% right-leaning reporting coverage versus just 19% from left-leaning sources. Led by a former NASA engineer, Ground News is a small team of independent media outsiders concerned about the future of news, and they're on a mission to make sure the world is well-informed where it's easy for readers to think freely about the issues of our times. So if you're looking for a better way to stay informed about current events around the world, check out Ground News by going to ground.news infographics. Since Russia invaded Ukraine back in February, the US has sent a literal mountain of lethal aid to the Ukrainian military. While support has largely gone to the Ukrainian army, the country's air force and navy have also gotten a huge helping hand, totaling almost $20 billion as of November 2022. Let's take a look at some of the weapon systems the US has sent to Ukraine so far. The war has frequently proven that being part of a tank crew is the most dangerous job on the battlefield. And for a good reason, the US has sent tons of anti-tank weaponry to Ukraine, with thousands of armored vehicles flooding the Ukrainian countryside and little armor to face the Russians, the Ukrainian military needed a big helping hand to deal with them. One of the most famous anti-tank weapons is the Javelin. The Javelin anti-armor missile system has been a mainstay of US forces since the mid-1990s. Part of the reason it's so effective is due to its ability to be a fire-and-forget weapon while also attacking its target from the top down. Because it is fire-and-forget, the operator can quickly run away once the missile leaves the tube to avoid enemy counterfire. This is because the missile will continue tracking the target once it's locked onto it. The top-down attack feature allows the operator to attack the most vulnerable part of a tank, its top armor. Most tanks have their heaviest armor up front, followed by the sides, rear, and lastly, the underbelly and top of the tank. Because the top is much weaker, a strong attack there will likely cause a catastrophic kill. A catastrophic kill is when the entire tank blows up and is completely destroyed rather than just being damaged, meaning enemy forces would be able to repair it later on. These attack platforms have proven themselves to be very effective, so the US military has sent over 8,500 of them to Ukraine. Now it's important to note that it's unclear if 8,500 means CLUs or disposable missile tubes. This is important because the brains of the Javelin is the Command Launch Unit or CLU. This attaches to a disposable missile tube that when combined makes the weapon system up. Regardless, Ukraine has gotten a ton of these. The US has not only been sending javelins but also 38,000 other anti-armor systems. While it's unclear what these could be, more likely, these are AT-4 rockets used as the replacement to the Vietnam-era law for decades. The AT-4 is a mainstay of man-portable anti-armor firepower. Its simple use-it-and-lose-it design makes it a simple but effective weapon system for engaging light-armored vehicles, buildings, bunkers, and anything else a soldier needs to blow up from a distance. While AT-4s are not a good alternative to javelins for taking out tanks, they are a great force multiplier for the hundreds of thousands of citizen soldiers Ukraine has recruited into its National Guard. These troops were being thrown into combat, often without a lot of training, at the beginning of the war. Putting this simple but effective weapon system in their hands makes them a force multiplier and boosts their confidence on the battlefield. Another great confidence booster has been the huge amount of artillery and artillery shells the US has sent over. After Ukraine repulsed the initial invasion and the Russians pivoted to eastern Ukraine, the war became a war of artillery. 
Numerous observers have noted that the Russian army blasts their artillery day and night without end. On the other hand, Ukrainian artillery has been literally outgunned by both number of guns and the amount of ammunition each one could fire. With Ukrainian troops suffering almost constant bombardment, the US decided to give them some tools to help even the playing field. As part of its comprehensive aid package, the US has sent 142 155mm guns and 36 105mm guns along with over a million shells to feed them. The US sent more heavy artillery systems because the Ukrainians needed longer range artillery. Since older Soviet artillery systems did not have the range of modern Russian equipment, the Russians could move outside the effective range of those systems and blast away at them. With heavy American artillery, Russian guns can no longer shoot away with impunity, since now they risk counterfire from a donated M777 howitzer. Another artillery system that's been in the news lately has been the 38 High Mobility Artillery Rocket Systems donated to Ukraine. These systems, known as HIMARS for short, are revolutionary weapons. Link 16 is one of the most common data links that the US military uses to send and receive encrypted data over a secure pathway. It's unbreakable and allows a free flow of communication without fear of being knocked out or intercepted. While mostly a Navy system, other branches have started using it like the Marine Corps. This is important because the HIMARS was the first Link-16 capable mobile rocket system the US ever built. This matters because Ukrainian defenders on the land, sea, or air who are up Link can send data to the firing units. Instead of a cumbersome patchwork of different networks and communication paths between other units or branches, Link-16 allows multiple units over a wide area to build a near instantaneous fire control solution. With that data, the HIMAR system can attack Russian troops anytime, anywhere, in real time within its range. With the huge number of troops involved, the US also sent a ton of ammunition to the Ukrainian army. Since February, the US has sent over 104 million rounds of small arms ammunition. As we've talked about before, the Ukrainians use a wide range of weapons dating back to World War II to more modern weapons we're used to seeing on a 21st century battlefield. We should be clear that most World War II weapons go to National Guard units, the bulk of their military is armed with modern equipment. The breakdown of the ammunition types is unclear. Most likely, it's 7.62 by 39 and 5.45 by 39, which are the calibers for AK-47s and AK-74s respectively. These two rifles make up the bulk of the current small arms inventory of Ukraine, so these are the most likely calibers. Other Soviet ammunition types used for their machine guns have likely come from Eastern European stocks. But the US did have large inventories of arms and ammo for the Afghan army, which is where our next weapon systems come from. Among the mix of ordnance, the US sent 20 Mi-17 Hind attack helicopters to the Ukrainian Air Force. The last time we checked, this was still a Russian-made attack helicopter. It ended up in the US inventory because the US purchased a bunch of these for the Afghan military. These were being refurbished in the United States, but after the fall of Afghanistan to the Taliban government, these helicopters were no longer needed, so the US sent them back to Ukraine. This is the perfect solution for this seemingly useless surplus of helicopters, as many Ukrainian helicopter pilots trained on similar Soviet legacy platforms. This is the main reason why the US has not flooded Ukraine with F-35s and other aircraft, because it would take years to train Ukrainian pilots to fly them. Another interesting weapon the US has sent includes 45 T-72B main battle tanks. While this has been a mainstay on the Ukrainian and Russian side, the US has never fielded this legacy Soviet gear. And while you might think the US brought some home from its two invasions of Iraq, you'd be mistaken. As part of a deal with Eastern European countries to empty their Soviet stocks and receive Western equipment, the Czech Republic donated its reserve tanks to Ukraine. However, these tanks had not been retrofitted with modern gun sights, night vision, or fire control computers. These upgrades and many more had to be done in the Netherlands before shipping them to Ukraine. In total, the Czechs donated 90 tanks to be refurbished and the US funded half the cost, which gives the figure of 45 T-72s. Ukrainian air defenses have also gotten a laundry list of early Christmas presents. Probably the most potent air defense system the US has sent has been eight National Advanced Surface to Air Missile Systems. NASMs are arguably the world's most potent ballistic missile defense system. Due to their high cost, the US only has a select few of these guarding the skies over Washington, D.C., and there's a reason why they cost so much. It doesn't matter how high, low, or fast a missile is, the NASMs can shoot it down. US Air Force testing proved it was the best anti-air defense system the service had ever operated. 
Gifting these to Ukraine has been a blessing since, during their first day in action, the NASAMs fired 10 missiles and brought down 10 Russian ballistic missiles. Another equally deadly but less sexy anti-air system is the good old-fashioned Stinger missile. This weapon system has resulted in Russian service members seeing their helicopters and aircraft knocked out of the sky at an alarming rate. In fact, Russia has lost so many aircraft that the fear of losing many more has rendered the Russian Air Force combat ineffective in Ukraine. This is because the US has sent over 1,600 Stinger missiles. Because of this, any bush, building, or tree could turn one of Russia's prized fighter planes into scrap metal. The US has not forgotten about the Ukrainian Navy. Arguably, the most shocking part about this war is the fact that Ukraine is beating the world's third largest navy without a navy. After the Russians illegally annexed Crimea, they seized the bulk of the Ukrainian Navy. Once the invasion started, the remaining ships in the Mykolaiv region were scuttled by their crews to prevent their capture by the rapidly advancing Russian army. Now, totally without a navy, Ukraine has still managed to punch back through the use of long-range ballistic missiles. In March, the Ukrainians damaged or sunk three Russian amphibious ships in port. In April, they sunk the Russian flagship Moskva with Neptune anti-ship missiles. While the US provided neither of these weapons, the US has provided two Harpoon anti-ship missile batteries that could be used. The US also sent over 58 coastal patrol boats. These are likely the now-retired Mark VI patrol craft serving the waterways of Iraq and the Arabian Gulf. These potent attack craft can move fast and punch well above their weight. But what is more interesting than that are the unmanned surface vessels. In the DoD report, there's a small section that lists an undefined number of unmanned coastal defense vessels. Currently, the US Navy does not employ any unmanned surface craft in its fleet. However, the Navy has been experimenting with them for years. Perhaps wanting to test out what they could really do, the US donated what they have developed so far to Ukraine. If they have, these craft might have already been used in combat. Back in October, unmanned surface vessels attacked the Russian fleet inside its home port of Sevastopol. The new Russian flagship and a minesweeper were damaged by the suicide boats. Ukraine never admitted where they'd gotten these attack craft from, but they were likely of US origin. All the items mentioned in this video are just a tiny part of the vast amounts of weapons and equipment sent by the US to Ukraine. We've not even touched on the huge number of different UAVs, other anti-air defenses, and radar systems. We also have yet to discuss the enormous numbers of mundane but equally important equipment like mobile hospitals, generators, body armor, and light armored vehicles. So watch out for another video explaining part 2 of US aid to Ukraine. Things are going badly for Russia and Ukraine, but just how badly? This is everything that has gone wrong for Russia so far, and we're less than a year and a half in. From the start of the war in Ukraine, Putin was boasting of total conquest, and one done quickly. After all, he had already annexed the massive Crimean Peninsula in 2014 with relatively little Western opposition, and now he was boasting of nuclear retaliation if anyone tried to stop him. Within a few weeks of the war starting, he now occupied over 62,000 square miles, almost 27% of the country, with ambitions of much more. And after another year of brutal combat, Putin now controls 18% of the country, with many regions being liberated by a scrappy Ukrainian military that makes Russia bleed for every single inch they occupy. If there is one rule in war, it's that you never want to see your army going backwards. But Russia has been struggling to make any gains in the war for over a year, and Ukraine is taking a lot more of Russia than vice versa. Russia's been seeing unsustainable losses in the war in Ukraine, starting with the human losses. Russia is largely cagey about the state of its military, which means that many updates come from Ukrainian officials. While they're likely to be optimistic about the success rates of taking out Russian soldiers, they also have an up-close and personal view of how many are falling in combat. On one single day in May 2023, Ukraine reported that Moscow lost 610 soldiers. This brought the staggering total to over 200,000 soldiers, approaching 10% of Russia's total military capacity. These are the troops Ukraine claims were liquidated, and it's not clear if this refers to deaths or includes injuries. While third-party assessments are lower, it's clear Russia suffered devastating losses. And that's just scratching the surface of those losses. While the deaths are most concerning, Russia's also seen an enormous number of non-fatal casualties. It's believed that in the same five-month period that saw 20,000 Russian troops die, a further 80,000 were injured and likely returned to Russia unable to fight on. It's no wonder, then, that Putin resorted to a military draft, putting many poorly trained soldiers into the fight, which likely only increased the casualty rates. Russia's desperation for more soldiers has led to them taking increased risks, including relying more heavily on mercenary troops. But it's not only the troops on the ground who are being targeted. One of the biggest hits Russia's been taking in this war of their own making 
has been to their military brass. Ukraine has been very effective at taking out commanding officers, with two colonels being reported dead in early May 2023. But the target list goes even further, with Ukraine reporting 14 Russian generals being killed in combat, although Russia only confirms four, as generals are typically kept well away from battle and direct troop movements from afar. This indicates that Ukraine has become incredibly effective at targeted assassinations of enemy forces. But of course, Russia has exacted a terrible price on Ukraine as well. Ukraine's total casualties are much lower than Russia's, but its army is smaller. It's estimated by US and European officials that Ukraine has suffered a total of at least 16,000 killed and 125,000 wounded. But that's not where the biggest impact on Ukraine comes from. Russia's primary combat tactic in Ukraine in recent months has been indiscriminately shelling cities, often as much for emotional impact and public intimidation than for strategic benefit. For instance, shortly before Ukraine's act was about to perform on the finals of Eurovision, Russia unleashed a series of missile strikes on the band's hometown of Ternopil. This has exacted a horrible toll as it's believed that at least 10,000 Ukrainian civilians had been killed so far by Russian attacks. And as many cities like Mariupol were essentially demolished and remain under Russian occupation, the actual numbers may be much higher. But this may make Russia's situation worse. From the start, Russia wasn't just facing the Ukrainian army and its backers, it was facing the tide of world opinion. And this tide was only going in one direction. 90% of countries around the world condemned the invasion, with the only exceptions being Russia's allies in China and a few countries generally considered outlaw states, North Korea, Iran, Belarus, Venezuela, and the Russian-backed puppet state in Syria. But well over a hundred nations spoke with one voice and called the largest scale invasion of a sovereign country in over a decade for what it was, a crime against humanity. And they backed it up with action. At the very start of the war, many people wondered how much the court of world opinion could actually do. After all, Ukraine wasn't a NATO nation, so the alliance wasn't bound to defend it. Putin was sending nuclear threats out every few minutes, and so no country was going to commit militarily to joining the fight. So the only tool left was sanctions, and people questioned what level of impact they could make. The answer turned out to be a lot. It wasn't long before the US and its allies unveiled a comprehensive list of sanctions that would be aimed at shattering the Russian economy and making it impossible for business as usual to continue. Were they successful? It's a mixed bag, but they've definitely had an impact. And for a change, it was the people at the top who felt its impact the most. One of the biggest targets of the sanctions placed on the regime was the group of Russian oligarchs who do Putin's business abroad. While they're ostensibly private citizens, many are close allies of the regime and operate at his sufferance. They have many economic holdings abroad, buying up real estate and even sports teams. An international task force was formed to shut them down and seize many of their assets. If they wound up on the list of sanctioned Russian agents, any foreign holding they had could be snatched up by the government. And in the first year of this task force alone, it's believed that the governments have taken over $30 billion from these oligarchs. Property seized includes Roman Abramovich's beloved Chelsea football team in the UK, as well as several luxury yachts, some worth as much as $300 million. But the damage done by the sanctions goes much deeper. The sanctions on Russia target both imports and exports, making it near impossible for Putin's loyalists to get key goods or sell them abroad. This means that many luxury goods have been frozen out of Russia, a key example being diamonds. After the US and UK joined by the EU banned the import of Russian diamonds, it threatened to cut off a $4 billion industry for the Russians. However, there was a spanner in the works, as many diamonds are sent to countries like India for polishing, which has not joined in on sanctioning Russia, Putin and his regime have often been able to evade sanctions thanks to the third-party transfer. And some of the sanctions aren't even government-sponsored. PR is everything in the world these days, and it's been a while since there was a bad guy who just about everyone agreed on, so let's thank Putin for unifying the world a bit, alright? Okay, maybe not, but he probably has the lowest global approval rating of any world leader at the moment, so it makes sense that many companies don't want their product or service associated with him. That led many companies to announce they were pulling out of Russia entirely at the start of the war. This included McDonald's, which was likely motivated by a combination of moral conviction and the growing risk of doing business in the politically repressive Russia. Netflix had another motivation, harsh new laws that would have it required to start providing Russian propaganda channels on the service. So, no Big Macs or Stranger Things for Vlad. But is this having an overall impact? The sanctions are hitting Russia hard. And one of the most important impacts of these sanctions is not as obvious as many think. 
Russia has largely been cut off from parts of the global financial sector. This includes the European Union, US, Canada, and UK, all freezing assets of the Russian central bank in their country. The US went further, going after all major Russian banks and banning Russian firms from taking out loans. The biggest impact, though, may be the removal of Russia from the financial messaging system SWIFT, which is used for handling international payments. This has made it much more difficult for Russia to effectively sell and receive payment for the few industries that weren't under sanctions. And that includes one key industry. At the start of the war, Russia thought it had one trump card, its massive oil and gas industry. The world governments opposing it had no problem cutting Russia off of every other industry, but to cut Russia out of energy would be cutting off their own nose to spite their face. Many countries in Europe had Russia as their main fossil fuel supplier for years, including Lithuania and Finland, which both got more than 80% of their oil imports from Russia. Even Germany got a full 30%, while the largest overall importer of Russian oil and gas is China, which had no interest in sanctioning Russia. Russia still stood to lose a lot if Europe cut it off, but it still had a lot to gain, assuming that if it withheld its own energy from Europe, these countries might be forced to lift sanctions in order to alleviate a very cold European winter. But Mother Nature had other plans for that. Winter in Europe can be brutally cold, and many analysts were predicting harsh measures to overcome the lack of Russian oil if Russia was cut off. People even talked about the return of lockdown-like measures, requiring non-essential businesses to close to conserve energy. But instead, Europe experienced the second warmest winter on record, a full 1.4 degrees above the average. While this didn't eliminate the need for Russian gas, it did give Europe the time to find alternative sources of energy to make up for the reduction in Russian imports. And while Europe has kept the supply chain open, it has imposed price caps on Russian oil, meaning even this key industry isn't safe from sanctions. But if you listen to Vladimir Putin, everything's fine. Putin's remained boastful and aggressive throughout the war, threatening retaliation over sanctions and military aid to Ukraine. When international companies picked up stakes and left, Russia seized the facilities they left behind and replaced them with Russian-owned ripoffs. Mick Dimitri's anyone? We hear they have a combo meal for the big tavarish. A big part of this is about making the Russian people feel like they're in a strong position, even if they're not. After all, Russian media is heavily controlled by the government and opposition views are cracked down on with extreme prejudice. But even this level of control can't last forever. At the start of the war, Russia was strongly in favor of the invasion. After all, Putin was boasting on taking Kyiv in only weeks, and there was a deep sense of pride and resentment in Russia stemming from the collapse of the Soviet Union. The prospect of reclaiming one of the biggest countries that gained independence in the collapse was appealing to the public, and they were willing to put up with some hardships in the aftermath. Early polls indicated that around three-fourths of Russians were in favor of prosecuting the war as needed. But a lot has changed in a year. Putin painted a rosy picture of the war in the opening days, but the reality turned out to be anything but. Kyiv didn't fall, with Ukraine pulling off a spectacular gambit by blowing up one of their own dams to prevent the city from being encircled. Then came the sanctions and the NATO weaponry, and soon Russian soldiers were coming back in body bags and Russia was seeing its weaponry blown up at record speed. Soon Putin was announcing a draft, and middle-class professionals were taken out of their lives and given a gun with a few weeks of training before they were sent to the Ukrainian meat grinder. And you can't keep that level of rage under control forever. Protests in Russia are usually fairly rare because the government is always watching. If protests start small, the ringleaders are quickly arrested, put on trial and given a harsh sentence to deter larger groups. But that didn't work in 2022. Protests started soon after the invasion with an estimate of almost 15,000 arrests in the first few weeks of the war. Things died down after that, as the combination of the high risk of protests and the intense Russian propaganda caused the anti-war activists to quiet down. But then, the mobilization happened, and something big changed. On September 21, 2022, the draft was announced, and within days, over 2,000 people were detained in protests. But this wasn't the same as the previous protests, which skewed toward young anti-war activists. These protests included many older women, mostly protesting for their sons' and husbands' lives. Additionally, word started going around that the draft was pulling heavily from ethnic minority groups in the Caucasus and eastern regions of the country. It was easy for Putin's shock troops to brutalize anti-war activists, call them terrorists, and be done with it. But it's a lot harder to arrest a babushka carrying a sign reading, we will not give up our husbands. While the protests were dispersed, they kept coming back, and the numbers kept increasing. So Putin had to do something he was naturally uncomfortable with, a charm offensive. Putin has largely kept himself off the stage for the duration of the war, 
giving orders from his inner sanctum and only communicating with his trusted advisors, who he didn't even trust that much. However, with the protests raging, Putin decided to hold a summit with the mothers of fallen soldiers in Ukraine and did his best impression of compassion. But saying I feel your pain only goes so far and many people said he seemed stiff and out of it during the summit. But this was a bigger problem for the Russian dictator. Many people wonder if Putin is reaching the end of the road. Rumors of Putin being sick have been circulating for a long time, with the few pieces of footage of him in recent years showing him looking stooped, awkward, and clumsy. A far cry from the healthy and hardy warrior who loved to take photos of himself bare-chested atop a horse like a medieval Russian warrior. Rumors range from COVID complications to terminal cancer, but information about Putin's health is kept extremely secure, so speculation is all that's left. Still, anytime people are talking about a leader's successor is not good for that leader. Old government hands like former President Dmitry Medvedev and Defense Secretary Sergei Shoigu no doubt have ambitions for the top job and are likely hoping to curry favor with Putin. But not everyone looking to take over might have the same strategy. Putin has relied heavily on his warlords and private armies to prosecute this war, and that may come back to haunt him if his grip on Russia is weakening. This might mean a potential bloody civil war and jockeying for power if he passes on suddenly before he could designate a successor. Various ethnic minority groups like Ramzan Kadyrov's Chechens could see the opportunity to seek independence or even try to seize control of Moscow. And the Wagner groups Yevgeny Prigozhin, who has been key to Russia's slow advance in Ukraine, might decide to turn his soft power into some very real power. But he might not be alone. Wagner's success has led other corporations like gas giant Gazprom to start their own private armies, not only to protect themselves from a government crackdown, but to guarantee their own power in the aftermath. Of course, Russia still has to get there because things are not going great. If you look at the Russian news, Russia has actually just had its biggest success in the war in the better part of a year. They finally took the eastern Ukrainian city of Bakhmut after a months-long battle that saw extreme casualties on both sides. While Ukraine has not formally conceded the city, most analysts say Russia has taken control. The only problem is, just like Mariupol, there really isn't a Bakhmut left to conquer. Before the war, Bakhmut had a population of over 70,000 people, and it's believed over 90% of them have left, leaving the city little more than a bombed-out husk. And while both sides suffered serious casualties, it was ultimately fairly one-sided. Estimates from the Ukrainian government were that as many as 100 Russian soldiers were dying each day. Things got so bad that even one of Putin's top soldiers spoke out. Prigozhin had become famous during the siege of Bakhmut for his blunt and entertaining critiques of the Russian war machine, accusing Putin of leaving his men without the proper arms and supplies they needed, and openly questioning Putin's leadership. This was normally a one-way trip to a quick retirement out the fourth floor of the nearest building, but the Wagner Group head is so far untouched, and the billionaire ultra-nationalist is only getting more popular in Russia, and it's hard to argue with his points. While Bakhmut does make it easier for Russia to advance in the east from their newly conquered routes, it's fair to ask you and what army? Because Russia is rapidly running out of, well, everything. Ukraine started the war with a much smaller army than Russia, but it has a near endless supply of weapons and supplies coming from NATO. Russia, on the other hand, is down to a few suppliers. While Iran and North Korea have happily supplied Russia with drones and other weapons, neither country has a boundless military capacity or budget. That means that Russia is pinning its hopes on a country with the second largest military budget in the world, China. And while Xi Jinping was initially very enthusiastic about the war, China has since backed off, instead talking about mediating the conflict. While Ukraine has no interest in a compromise, it isn't what Russia wants to hear either. They need weapons and fast, and China isn't being forthcoming. But getting them from China might be a double-edged sword. While China's posture toward the West makes supporting Russia convenient, they don't want to be seen as backing a loser, so the refusal to provide Russia with lethal aid keeps the war from descending into a full proxy war, until China determines it's to its advantage. But China has been providing Russia with supplies to keep its troops protected. The question is, what is China getting in return? China is known for giving out loans and gifts to other countries, building factories or bases there, and then calling in their loans. This means that not only might Russia end the war with a shattered economy and a military, but they might be in debt to a rapidly growing country that would look to turn it into a vassal state. But despite this, analysts don't really see any way out. Russia has a dog-eat-dog -dog system of government, with weakness usually being seen as an opportunity for the next to jump the line. 
After all, the infamous Nikita Khrushchev, known for terrorizing the US on the world stage, saw his career ended not by death or retirement, but by a coup from within the Communist Party because he was seen as too moderate. When the war in Ukraine began, Putin no doubt saw it as a capper on his legacy, avenging the loss of the Soviet Union, placing Ukraine back under Russian control with a puppet government, and sending the message to the rest of the world that Russia was still a great power to be feared. The reality has sent a very different message. It's hard to sum up just how much has gone wrong for Russia in the last year, besides saying everything. Russia's found itself with only a few allies, stripped of its prestige in the international sphere, and exposed militarily. While Russia keeps its actual statistics close to its chest, it's clear that it might take the country decades to recover its military capacity after the war. Russia's lost over 70 planes in Ukraine, more than 2,000 tanks from its mainly Cold War arsenal, and dozens of ships, including their flagship Moskva, a massive guided missile cruiser considered one of Russia's most famous ships. This was not only a major military loss, but a massive propaganda win for Ukraine. Making things worse, there may be no off-ramp. It's unlikely that Putin will ever back down from this war, since he knows his career and possibly his life is dependent on victory. And since Russia is essentially a one-party state, with only the communists allowed to pose token opposition, he can't be voted out of office by disgruntled people. The biggest threat to him is his own mortality, or a coup from within which might lead to the rise of someone who's even more of a hardliner and likely to escalate the war as Russia's military finds itself even more in dire straits. And if the war does come to an end, things might not get any rosier for Russia. While some left-wing world leaders like the governments of Brazil and South Africa have called for diplomacy, this is likely only to happen when one side is forced to the negotiating table. Even if Russia withdraws, that doesn't mean the sanctions will go away. That will likely be a part of the negotiating package and would require Russia to withdraw from all territory and pay reparations to rebuild Ukraine. This is probably unlikely. Most Russian leaders wouldn't be willing to take that black eye. Additionally, Ukrainian President Zelensky has been firm on the fact that all territory means all territory, including the Crimean Peninsula taken from Ukraine in 2014 and currently facing a potential counterinsurgency. So Russia might be between a rock and a hard place. Do they plow forward, continuing to advance in Ukraine one acre and hundreds of soldiers at a time as their military supplies get lower and lower and sanctions pile up? Or do they try to negotiate their way out of a humiliating loss and hope the winning coalition shows mercy? No matter the outcome, it is a far cry from Kyiv by April. It wasn't supposed to be like this. The war in Ukraine was supposed to be a cakewalk for Russia, a nuclear-armed great power, as they swept into their smaller neighbor and just subjugated them. In fact, as the war began in 2022, Putin was making bold claims of conquering Ukraine within weeks and then turning his sights on the nations on Ukraine's border. Instead, over a year later, the vast majority of Ukrainian territory is still in Ukraine's hands. Life in Kyiv goes on, with the primary threat being occasional aerial bombardment from Russia. Most of the combat is confined to the eastern swath of Ukraine that Putin quickly conquered in the early days of the war, and even that is hotly contested by dogged Ukrainian defenders. NATO weapons continue to flow into the resilient Eastern European nation, and Ukraine has even made noises toward making a fight for the Crimean Peninsula, which Russia annexed back in 2014. So, how did it all go so horribly wrong for Russia, and how did Putin initially see the war ending? At the beginning of the war, it wasn't just Putin who thought the war would be quick and end badly for Ukraine. Most of Ukraine's allies did as well. In the opening days, Putin was making outlandish nuclear threats and most of Ukraine's supporters were issuing condemnations but quietly trying to convince President Zelensky to evacuate with his family and fight on in exile. But Zelensky knew that this was far from a guarantee of safety, given how many of Putin's enemies have wound up drinking polonium cocktails, so he and Ukraine fought on. And it would largely all come down to one key battle. Today, Putin talks about liberating Russian-speaking areas of Ukraine and has even annexed some of them in sham referendums, but that wasn't his target in the opening days. That was the heart of Ukraine. Putin was making the claim that Ukraine needed to be denazified, considered by most to be a ridiculous claim given that Ukraine's current president is Jewish. And to do that, he intended to strike at Kyiv, the capital of Ukraine. He assumed, and was probably right, that if Ukraine's capital was conquered and its government was toppled, there would be no organized resistance and the world would eventually grudgingly accept the conquest in the same way the world accepted China's takeover of Tibet. But Ukraine proved to have something to say about that. 
In the early days of the war, support for Ukraine was still tentative. Between Putin's threats and doubts over whether Ukraine had a chance of fighting back, governments hadn't committed heavy military aid yet. Ukraine was largely on its own as people waited to see if the government and the army would hold out long enough for them to step in and make the difference. And the threat was coming fast, but not from Russia's border. Kyiv is far from Russia, but is far closer to another border, that of Belarus. A former Soviet Socialist Republic ruled by the infamous dictator Alexander Lukashenko, and Putin had a chip to call in. Lukashenko is largely Putin's only ally left in Europe, but their relationship isn't equal. Lukashenko was nearly toppled several years back by populist uprisings following another rigged election that kept him in power, and Putin offered him support and supplies. The result was Lukashenko clinging on to power, but it's now heavily in debt to Putin. While Belarus has not committed troops to Ukraine and is believed to not pose much of a threat if it did, its geographic advantage was more than enough for Putin, because the troops were about to pour in from the north. Only days after the war began, Russian forces began attacking near Kyiv, first trying to take the airport in the city of Hostomel. The Russian forces had surprise and firepower on their side and overtook the airport in less than a day. Soon Kyiv was under attack from a combination of Russian saboteurs, ground gunfire, and air attack. By the next morning, heavy aerial bombardment of the city had begun, and no one was sure how long Kyiv could hold out. The Ukrainian defenders were fighting back fiercely, but they were heavily outgunned. But then the tide started turning. It was clear Russia's plan was to choke off Kyiv, and a key part of that was cutting off the power. An attack on a nearby power plant could have plunged much of the city into darkness, but the attack on the Troyeshina neighborhood instead saw the Russian forces running. While Ukrainian forces took heavy losses, they were defending the city center, keeping Russian agents from approaching within 19 miles of the heart of the city. That kept the government and much of the civilian population safe, and Zelensky was going to keep it that way. Several key policy decisions made the difference in keeping Kyiv from falling, the first of which was the government's decision to impose a curfew on the city during the nighttime. That made it much harder for Russians to infiltrate the city by impersonating civilians. Anyone out during the night was deemed a saboteur, and they could face deadly force. That meant any Russian sabotage would have to happen during the daytime, when it could be more easily detected and repelled. And the defense of the city would be heavily organized by one man. Ukraine seems to have a thing for celebrity politicians who surprise the world. Zelensky got his start as an actor who played the president on an acclaimed comedy. And Kyiv's mayor is currently the world-famous boxer Vitaly Klitschko, who helped to organize the people to combat the Russian attack and oversaw the curfew. While Klitschko was condemned for accidentally releasing false information that the city was encircled, he's been praised as one of the faces of the Ukrainian resistance. Now it was clear that Kyiv could fight back, things were only going to intensify. When a Russian convoy tried to set up a base in Kyiv, they met fierce opposition from locals and were routed. In the opening days of the battle, civilians were using Molotov cocktails and other improvised weapons to fend off the Russians, but that was only until weapons could be distributed. The Ukrainian military acted quickly to distribute over 18,000 guns during the first day of the battle, and Ukraine activated its territorial defense forces from the reserves. Combined with the civilian forces, Ukraine was looking like it could turn the tide, and that meant Russia was about to step things up. Over the next month, Russia would continue to bombard Kyiv and send in large convoys of troops and weapons. But by this point, military aid was flowing in, and Kyiv had the reinforcements it needed. As Russian troops tried to knock out Kyiv's infrastructure, Russia saw itself take massive losses. Multiple attempts to encircle Kyiv failed, and Ukraine was able to maintain corridors in and out of the city that allowed aid to come in and civilians to flee. Russia, meanwhile, saw its momentum stall as Ukraine began to retake territory. By March 22nd, Ukraine would launch its own counteroffensive, and soon they would pull off one of the most impressive military moves in recent memory. The Russians were aiming to make their way into Kyiv via the Irpin River, and had built themselves a series of pontoon bridges to make it easier to cross. While Ukraine heavily targeted the bridges, there was still one remaining. If the Russians got across, it could allow for them to gather their forces and overwhelm the city, which meant it was time to go big. Ukraine made the risky decision to blow the dam at the Kyiv Reservoir, taking out a key part of their own infrastructure and causing a flood that swelled the river, taking out the final pontoon bridge without ever firing a shot. The Russians fled the surge of water and found themselves stranded in a swamp where they were vulnerable to Ukrainian counterattacks. It was the latest devastating blow to the Russians in a humiliating phased offensive. 
and slowly but surely Kyiv was starting to feel safe again. On March 29th, Russia announced it was pulling out of Kyiv while conceding nothing and not promising a cessation of attacks. This led to key moves such as the EU Parliament president visiting Kyiv, the first EU official to visit since the war began. But even more important to many shell-shocked residents of the city, Klitschko removed the temporary ban on liquor sales so everyone could celebrate their victory. But there would be no celebration in Moscow. While Russia had been humiliated in Kyiv, the country was still looking like the heavy favorite in the war. After all, they had conquered a large swath of Ukraine in the east and were taking control of the Black Sea. They were seeking to intimidate the rest of the world out of getting involved. But the problem was, Russia wasn't looking all that intimidating anymore. For the first time in the war, the mighty Russian bear looked beatable. And that would change the battlefield in other ways. For the first time, people were considering the chance of a Ukrainian victory, and Putin wanted to stomp that out as quickly as he could. If he couldn't win fast, he would win slow, by grinding Ukraine and its allies down to nothing. A combination of a brutal offensive taking towns piece by piece and ruthless aerial bombardments of cities including Kyiv would slowly break the spirit of the Ukrainian fight and eventually supplies would dry up. There was just one wild card, the potential intervention of NATO and other allies of Ukraine. And Putin wanted the whole world to see that he wouldn't be beaten easily. At the same time as the Battle of Kyiv was turning into a shocking Ukrainian victory, another battle was unfolding far away, with a very different outcome. The coastal city of Mariupol was not a major city, but it was a key strategic location, and Putin was quickly overwhelming it. The siege of Mariupol began days before the attack on Kyiv and continued almost for two months. Unlike Kyiv, it was not a strategic game of subterfuge, it was a slow, grinding, brutal affair that provided a preview to how Putin would attempt to win the war in the long stretch. And it came with a horrific human cost. In addition to a heavy troop presence, Russia hit Mariupol with aerial bombardments for weeks at a time, leading to most of the citizens evacuating the bombed-out city. What remained was little more than a husk occupied by dogged Ukrainian defenders waging a guerrilla war against the Russian occupiers. But even they couldn't hold out forever. On May 25th, the last defenders surrendered and Russia formally took control of the city, or at least what was left of it. It was the most significant Russian military victory of the war, but it also left them with little more than a strategic outpost and a moral victory victory, because Mariupol was essentially gone. Was this a sign of things to come? Putin's plan for a slow, grinding win to the war hinged on a few key factors. For one thing, he assumed that there was a point where Ukraine's suffering would grow so great they would be willing to come to the negotiating table and give him what he wanted, which was probably everything. The other element was that he assumed the supply of aid and weapons from NATO would dry up eventually due to a lack of success and the heavy drain on the government's budget, as well as some good old-fashioned intimidation and he had several cards to play. So how did Putin intend to break the spirit of the West? The tactic he used from the start was threats, and lots of them. Putin controls the largest nuclear arsenal in the world, although no one knows just how much of that Cold War era arsenal is functional anymore. But the odds are that a few of those missiles could hit their target, and that fear might have been enough to scare some people off of getting directly involved. Putin doesn't acknowledge Ukraine as an independent nation and has repeatedly cast the war as an internal matter and implied that any attempt to take back areas annexed by Russia would be attacking Russia. But the threats only go so far. It's a hard lesson many parents learn when raising unruly kids. Threats only work as many times as it takes for them to figure out you're not going to follow through. Of course, the stakes are much higher here, but Putin's early threats of nuclear war and attacking NATO turned out to be a lot of hot air. NATO didn't attack Russian planes, despite early calls for a no-fly zone, and NATO troops were not on the ground in the battle for Ukraine. So anyone could see that an attack by Putin would be the one that escalates the situation, and would bring the whole alliance down on Putin's already weakened arsenal. But that doesn't mean he didn't have other weapons in his playbook. The war didn't end in spring or summer, as Putin had hoped, but that led to his next strategy. Because winter was coming and everyone knows Russian winters are brutal. Not only did Putin hope this would slow down the Ukrainian pushback, but it gave him a new way to turn the screws on Europe. Despite the heavy economic sanctions on Russia, there was one area that wasn't fully cut off oil and natural gas. That's because much of Europe relies on Russia as their primary supplier of heating supplies. While turning off the pipelines might have hurt Russia's economy even further, it would have had far more devastating impacts on Europe, forcing partial shutdowns to conserve energy at best and killing thousands in a cold snap at worst. But it turns out Ukraine might have another ally, Mother Nature. 
While there were some cold periods, Europe turned out to have a surprisingly warm winter. This didn't mean they didn't need gas, but it did mean the demand was low enough that they had time to amass additional supplies from other places around the world. Not only did this mean Russia couldn't effectively blackmail Europe to stop aiding Ukraine, but it potentially meant that Europe would develop new connections that would allow it to wean itself off of Russian gas and oil entirely leaving a key pillar in Russia's economy in shambles, which led to Russia asking itself, what's the exit strategy? While the first month of the war brought good news to Russia with one fast military victory after another, it's been all downhill from there. Not only have they largely been held to the gains they had in the opening days of the war, but Ukraine has taken back many key locations and forces Russia to fight for every inch. Any town Russia takes, like the mining town of Solidar, is largely destroyed by the end of the fighting. While Russia has been trying to recapture the eastern city of Bakhmut for months, getting dangerously close to encircling it, Ukraine continues to hold out as of mid-April 2023. And that leaves Putin with another major problem. Both Russia and Ukraine need soldiers to keep fighting, and neither one can rely on outside fighters. While Ukraine has extensive support from much of the world in the form of aid and weapons, no one's going to risk declaring war on Putin by sending troops, and Putin has few allies left. Not even Belarus is willing to send troops. This is mostly because Russian troops in Ukraine are little more than cannon fodder, and the barracks are getting awfully empty. Putin has already had to resort to a largely reviled draft, which drew heavily from ethnic minority regions of the country and sent countless troops into combat with outdated supplies. And a second go could risk a full uprising against Putin. So is the war destined to end in defeat for Putin? It seems likely, as he's losing in every way that counts. He's increasingly isolated from the world is running low on troops and weapons, and has been unable to get any momentum going and taking more territory. Many leaders would have cut their losses, but those leaders aren't Vladimir Putin. Putin no doubt feels that if he takes this massive loss, he'll be seen as past his prime and incredibly vulnerable to a coup from within, either from a moderating force or from a hardliner who would want to take on NATO directly. Putin wants to cast himself as the indispensable man, and that means he has no effective way out. So he's hoping to get by with a little help from his friends. Putin's latest and possibly last hope in how the war in Ukraine will end is to make it a global affair. From the start, most people have thought the war was a very straightforward moral affair. After all, it's a former superpower picking a fight with a smaller country with no nuclear weapons in a revival of the Cold War dynamic of the mostly democratic Western Europe and the dictator-driven Eastern Europe. America and NATO certainly view it that way, but Putin's trying to flip the script, and he has a few audiences in mind. The few allies Putin has left are largely fellow outlaw nations, in addition to Russian puppet state Belarus and war-torn Syria, where Putin's largely kept its leader in power. The few countries supporting Russia include Iran, North Korea, and Venezuela, all of which are staunch opponents of the United States and more than willing to complicate affairs for their nemesis. Both Iran and North Korea are no doubt happy to have a new client for their sanctioned weapons programs, but none of them are strong enough to turn the tide of the war. The same can't be said for a more reluctant ally. In the early days of the war, Xi Jinping's China was one of the few countries to express support for Russia's invasion, even going so far as to announce a new partnership. Both countries are staunchly opposed to a US-run world order, and both stand to benefit from a new age of conquest, where more powerful countries can simply take what they want. And she, of course, has one target in mind, the disputed island nation of Taiwan, which China considers a rogue province. Taiwan is also home to the world's largest collection of semiconductor facilities and plays an incredibly key role in the world's technology sector, so conquering it would give China a huge edge in a larger war. So why isn't China offering more aid to Russia? While China's early statements were highly supportive, they've since cooled off, calling for peace talks. While the rumored terms of the peace talks were highly mocked by those in the West, it still points to them trying to play the middle. And while they've provided Russia with sanctions, relief, and supplies for combat, they haven't provided them with one thing on Putin's wish list, lethal aid. Russia has been receiving no weapons from China, and the fear of secondary sanctions being imposed on China's economy might be a big reason why. But there is another reason why, and it might be more important. Currently, Russia looks like a loser, with no major military victories to its name in a long time and the country under an iron boot of sanctions. 
The odds of a Russian victory don't look strong enough for Xi Jinping to want to risk China's place in the global economy in order to boost his military ambitions. It's also not clear if a Russian victory would actually make it easier for China to invade Taiwan, as the US might be more motivated to protect the country before anything can happen rather than try to provide aid after the fact. And it's unlikely that any other potential allies would be able to help either. Putin's been struggling to get traction in military affairs, but he has some success in another area, a charm offensive. Putin's been casting himself as the champion of the oppressed global south, which has largely been mocked by those in the West as cheap propaganda. But as long as the US remains the world's dominant superpower, there will be those who see anything opposing its power as automatically the underdog. Putin's gotten words of support from the new leader of Brazil, President Lula, who's blamed Ukraine and NATO for helping to provoke the conflict. While South Africa hasn't actively defended Putin, the current leadership has said they won't help to enforce rulings from the International Criminal Court against him, which will at least give Putin a few more possible vacation spots, which leaves Putin a man in search of an endgame. Putin's best shot for a victory in Ukraine came at the very beginning of the war when he tried to overrun Kyiv, and that very public failure made it seem like opposing the war in Ukraine was a risk worth taking. Since then, it's all been downhill, and he's facing headwinds as he fights for every last scrap of territory. He simply doesn't have the resources to oppose a NATO-backed Ukraine, and he also doesn't have the manpower to hold out against an increasingly motivated Ukrainian military. As long as Ukraine has willing suppliers, Putin's choices are to retreat or lose slowly. That is, as long as they have suppliers. Putin's main hope for victory right now lies in political change, as a wave of authoritarian right-wing leaders and popular far-left leaders all jockey for power in countries currently led by center-left and center-right leaders. There have already been a few changes in leadership that have worked in Putin's favor, such as in Israel. While Israel is always very cautious in aiding Ukraine due to Russia's presence in Syria on its border, the previous government was seen as a more pro-Ukraine compared to the current right-wing Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And even NATO might not be immune to a dramatic shift. The UK seems to be pretty firmly locked down as pro-Ukraine now that controversial contrarian Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn has been ousted. However, the same can't be said for France. Current President Emmanuel Macron is firmly supportive of Ukraine, but his administration is besieged by street protests, and both the primary opponents, arch-right radical Marine Le Pen and the hardline socialist Jean-Luc Mélenchon have spoken of disengaging from NATO and Ukraine. As the European Union's only nuclear power, France leaving the pro-Ukraine bloc would be a major blow. Of course, one player would have more influence than any other. Ukraine has had no more loyal ally than the United States, with President Joe Biden providing a near-endless supply of aid, supplies, and weapons, including high-level tanks and state-of-the-art missile defense systems. As the leader of the Democratic Party, Biden has kept them firmly in line, with the vast majority of the party backing aid as well as sanctions on Russia. The same can't be said for the Republicans, who are much more firmly divided. While many party members view opposing Russia as a national security issue, Putin also has supporters like renegade Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, who frequently uses Twitter to bemoan how much money is going to Ukraine. But one potential supporter might have more influence than any other. The war in Ukraine launched in 2022, but Putin's been on the outs with the United States for a long time, save for four years. When Donald Trump was in office, he and Putin were just short of besties. And even today, the always controversial Trump has mostly good things to say about his buddy Vlad. He's also complained about the US getting involved in foreign wars and vowed to cut back on aid for Ukraine if he's elected to a second term in 2024. And while he's currently under indictment and facing various other legal issues, it hasn't dented his popularity with the party much, as he's still considered the favorite for the GOP nomination. Which means that Putin's current strategy for victory might hinge on waiting this administration out and hoping his old friend gets back in. The invasion of Ukraine will go down as one of the greatest military boondoggles in modern history. Already the lessons learned are being taught in military academies around the world. But how did Vladimir Putin end up grossly miscalculating his chance to win the war? The war has been raging for one year and three months as of the writing of this script. Estimates vary wildly, and neither side has any interest in letting real figures out. But moderate estimates for casualties place the war at a total of 70,000 killed and 310,000 wounded. Of those, Russia is believed to have suffered 50,000 dead and 180,000 wounded, giving it the lion's share of the death count. Given Russia's extreme artillery advantage, though, Ukrainian wounded are only about 50,000 behind Russian wounded, despite having less than half the dead. 
This is because artillery is extremely good at wounding, but not so good at killing entrenched troops. Russia has already suffered nearly as many confirmed KIA as the US did during the entire duration of the Vietnam War, 20 years of direct involvement. In terms of gains, Russia has at best temporarily secured large parts of the separatist East, but has failed to fully consolidate the breakaway republics, which are now, at least according to Russian law, officially part of Russia. The international community, however, does not recognize the illegal annexation of Ukraine's east. In exchange for tenuous control over the Ukrainian breakaway regions, Russia has lost immeasurably more. Over 1,000 Western companies have either fully or at least partially pulled out of Russia, taking a significant amount of investment capital with them, dealing significant damage to the Russian economy. Prices on many goods have doubled or more, though the Russian economy remains relatively stable thanks to a significant war chest Putin had built up over the years for exactly this scenario. The bad news is about half of that $600 billion reserve was frozen at the onset of the war, and the remaining has been steadily draining away as Russia attempts to keep the Russian economy afloat. Exact economic data can be difficult to find, as Russia no longer allows for independent verification of its market figures. Instead, Russian officials have been feeding organizations like the IMF their own data, which, much to their discredit, the IMF has happily published without an ounce of skepticism. However, independent analysis of the Russian economy by multiple American and British groups have found an economy in serious trouble, only kept afloat by significant government spending. But its deficit hit a record of $1.8 trillion at the start of this year, with revenues falling by about a third and spending growing by 58%. Russian GDP dropped by between 2.2% or up to 3.9% depending on who you ask and none who you could ask have been granted access to internal Russian financial data. The true GDP loss could be significantly higher than that, and only expected to continue. Revenues from the export of energy have fallen significantly thanks to a painful European embargo and the imposing of price caps on Russian oil by the EU. This means that nobody using European ships, infrastructure or any ships or infrastructure insured by a European agency is allowed to purchase oil at a higher price than the $100 a barrel for products that trade at a premium to crude, and $45 for products traded at a discount, such as fuel oil and naphtha. The price cap was not meant to destroy the Russian energy sector though, and criticism about its ineffectiveness is completely missing the point. Europe wants Russia to continue selling oil, it just doesn't want it making a profit on it. Given the increased distances to ship certain products out of the EU and to foreign markets, as well as the inefficiency of Russian equipment, cost of setting up new trade routes, and infrastructure, Russia is estimated to be at a break-even point on oil revenue. This means it's earning just about as much as it spends on extracting, refining, and shipping, which prompted Russia to begin to tax its oil companies at the price of Brent crude, rather than what its own oil is actually earning. This is obviously unsustainable and will cripple the Russian oil sector for decades as it sucks out funds for expansion, exploration, and basic maintenance. While nations like India and China are greatly benefiting from the deeply discounted oil and thus earning some amount of international ire, a complete boycott would be the exact opposite of what the EU wants. If Russian oil disappeared overnight, it would drive the cost of other oil supplies through the roof, hence why the EU wants Russia to continue selling its energy supplies. Things are still getting worse for Russia, though. The Ukrainian counteroffensive has already begun as of the writing of this script, with shaping operations utilizing HIMARS and Storm Shadow missiles deep behind enemy lines. Ukraine's preparing the battlefield for the coming offensive, and part of that preparation includes helping the Freedom of Russia Legion and Russian Volunteer Corps launch attacks inside of Russia. Multiple times now, both groups have crossed the border from Ukraine into Russia, with their most high-profile attack into Belgorod, seeing them occupy multiple villages for two days before pulling back. The ongoing raids across the border are brazen and are helping fuel panic amongst the Russian population. A subsequent drone swarm attack against Moscow at the end of May fed even more fuel to the fire, as Vladimir Putin was left looking incompetent and incapable of defending his own capital from a drone attack. While the drones weren't armed with high explosives, at least three buildings were struck in the wealthy Moscow suburbs, injuring two and causing minor damage. The real point of the attack was to erode Russian support for Putin and to incite public anger against the wealthy elite who have leached off Russian society for decades. When the attacks were announced, the Russians around the country celebrated the fact that they had struck inside the same communities where government and business elite live. Putin is a president up a creek without a paddle. So, how'd he get here? 
It all began with a botched intelligence assessment of the situation inside of Ukraine before the invasion was launched. Vladimir Putin entrusted his plans to only a few advisors. Fearing leaks and a Western rush to supply Ukraine with arms meant to discourage an invasion, the plan to attack Ukraine was kept secret and only within a very small, tight circle. However, this meant that nobody in the military was prepared. Neither was Russia's intelligence apparatus. As Putin was preparing his invasion, he decided to take the temperature of Ukraine by tasking the FSB to do the job of infiltrating Ukraine and gauging how a Russian invasion would be met. Details remain incredibly murky, but by all accounts Russian intelligence did not believe Putin would be brazen enough to actually invade. Given the extreme state of the corruption inside of Russia, the intelligence agents assigned this delicate task apparently fabricated their reports, pocketing the millions of rubles assigned to them instead of spending them on their mission. Thus, as Putin reviewed plans to invade Ukraine, he was assured the Ukrainians would meet the Russians as liberators. Famously, the Ukrainians did not, in fact, meet the Russians as liberators. Shockingly, though, Russia's intelligence failure was so bad that even in Ukraine's east, which is the most pro-Russian part of the nation, Putin's forces were met with violence rather than jubilation. The expected collapse of the Ukrainian military did not occur, and while a handful of senior military officers and political officials did cooperate, it was not the flood of insider support that Putin had expected. The approaches to Mariupol had been demined, but the people of Mariupol resisted nonetheless. Russia's second intelligence failure was in properly assessing the state of the Ukrainian military. Many Americans have had some experience training alongside the Ukrainians as part of multiple ongoing missions after the end of the Cold War. One soldier we spoke with described Ukraine's military in the early 2010s as, quote, a complete joke. Discipline was low, facilities were terrible, training was worse, and the soldiers received so little respect that civilian contractors regularly bullied them, even running through a guard post they had erected to serve as a traffic checkpoint. Nobody respected the military because Ukraine's military in the early 2010s still resembled the Russian military of that same era a husk of its former self from the Soviet days, with corruption rampant and every soldier out for themselves. What Russia's intelligence failed to take note of, though, was that it did not remain that way. After the 2014 invasion of Crimea, NATO stepped up its support for Ukraine, fearing a wider Russian invasion. Along with the support came sweeping reforms, and while today the Ukrainian military continues to struggle with its Soviet roots, Thanks to many older officers and NCOs who had their start in the Soviet system, the Ukrainian armed forces are now a capable and competent force. Things aren't perfect, there's still some corruption and the UAF's military doctrine is lacking in large areas, but Ukraine has proven its military is adaptable and a very quick study of the Western way of war. Russia, however, missed what was taking place right under its own border. It failed to see the restructuring of the Ukrainian military and the professionalism that began to grow in the wake of the 2014 invasion when UAF forces largely cut and run at the sight of Russian tanks. It failed to take note of the battle-hardened veterans it had created through ongoing fighting in the east of the country against Russian-backed separatists, and it failed to note the influx of manned portable anti-tank and air defense weapons along with Western training instructors. When Russia crossed that border into Ukraine, it faced a military that had radically evolved in the last eight years. In large part, though, Russia's invasion of Crimea helped Putin disastrously miscalculate how the West would respond. As Russian forces poured into Crimea, the West did little to stop Putin. Sanctions were enacted, but these were weak and anemic, with most of Europe leery of angering their number one energy supplier over a piece of a former Soviet republic. Sanctions would eventually be strengthened, and we would just see how effective sanctions targeting dual-use technology would be as Russia entered into Ukraine with a critical shortage of drones. However, overall, the West's response was tepid at best, even as Moscow fueled an ongoing violent civil war in Ukraine's east. Convinced that the West would respond similarly, Putin was emboldened to invade again, only this time to not take just a piece of the pie, but the whole thing. To be fair, he had a good reason to believe the West would once more let him get away with the invasion. America was and continues to be divided politically, in no small part thanks to Russian influence operations. These same influence operations have been ongoing in Europe since the late 2000s and helped fuel Brexit while funneling money to right-wing parties and individuals. Russia's been sowing xenophobia and nationalism in its bid to splinter the EU and the NATO alliance, or at least weaken it and distract it from his schemes in Eastern Europe. This has largely worked, but nobody could predict that rather than fall apart, the US and Europe would come together. Despite continued political division in the US, 
the nation largely remains united behind support for Ukraine. Europe likewise has been strongly supporting Ukraine, with nations like Poland practically declaring war on Russia on their own as they push every available piece of hardware across the border as quickly as they can. Westerners have grown fat and lazy, too concerned with their own good lives to shoulder any sacrifice, is the thinking of many Chinese political scientists, who believe that the West would crumble if its comfortable way of life was threatened. Putin too believed the same thing, and nobody could have predicted the astonishing speed and severity of sanctions that followed Russia's invasion. Europe, who had been warned by the US to not deepen its energy ties with Russia as it provided Putin leverage, took on the incredibly painful task of severing its energy dependence on Russia, something which would have been unthinkable at the dawn of 2022. Inevitably though, Putin made the mistake of invading, and very quickly discovered that he had been drinking his own Kool-Aid. Just two months before the invasion, major Western publications were publishing articles warning about Russia's quote, modern and proficient combined arms military. Nobody questioned that Russia had the world's second strongest military, and the thoughts of Russia's combined arms armies crossing the border into the Baltics terrified NATO military planners. We ourselves were drinking that same Kool-Aid alongside the vast majority of analysts and think tanks in the world, publishing a video on how formidable Russia's military had become months before the invasion of Ukraine. In a way, the world can't really be blamed too much for falling for this illusion. Information is tightly controlled inside Russia, and the nation had put on a series of large-scale exercises showing off its combined arms prowess. After the Zaphad 2016 exercise, the US Defense Intelligence Agency noted that, quote, Russia's forces are becoming more mobile, more balanced, and capable of conducting the full range of modern warfare. What the world missed, however, was that these exercises were highly choreographed, and Russian troops would find that real military operations are a lot harder when someone's actively trying to kill you. Putin, however, also fell for that little lie that the Russian military was a modern and capable force simply because it looked good in an exercise field or on parade. And here he's both at fault but also not to blame. The Russian military is thoroughly corrupt, the depth and scale of which has been kept secret until the invasion of Ukraine. Shortly after crossing the border, the Russian military revealed its rotten core to the world, and it is this systemic corruption that helped fuel Putin's miscalculation. Corruption exists at every level of the military. Young enlisted troops, either volunteers or conscripts, prey on brand new troops, beating and abusing them while stealing everything they can from them sometimes even forcing them to ask family for more money just so they can steal it. Few NCOs exist because not many conscripts choose to remain to serve as professional soldiers, and NCO training is non-existent in the form known in the West, where new NCOs attend specialized training. What NCOs do exist, though, prey on their underlings as they themselves are preyed upon by their officers. At nearly all levels, though, it is wanton and blatant theft. Troops steal the copper wiring from their own vehicles so they can sell it, and officers steal funds meant for training or equipment upkeep. A common practice in the Russian military is what's known as photo reports. Rather than file a detailed report on unit training goals, status, and results, Russian officers simply take photos of their troops' training and send it up the chain. Naturally, this leads to incidents such as an officer taking his troops out to the firing range, having everyone fire a few rounds while he takes a photo or a short video, and then immediately terminating the training. The officer can then pocket all the money not spent on training, while the unit fails to maintain their proficiency or build even basic soldiering skills. Further up the chain, unit commanders falsify records to show their units have more men than they actually have. This is because soldiers' pay is given directly to their unit commander, whose job it is to divvy it among the men. Naturally, the more men in a unit, the more pay that unit will receive, with the commander pocketing the pay of every phantom soldier he lied about in his paperwork. However, most will also skim some right off the top anyway, shorting their own troops. At even higher levels, scams run rampant. One Russian senior officer was imprisoned shortly after the invasion when it was discovered that he had sold hundreds of gallons of fuel meant for his armored vehicles to local villagers. These fuel scams are very common, as well as outright theft of military property such as weapons, ammunition, or ordnance, which can be sold on the black market. At the acquisitions level, corruption is so common, the cost of it is baked into the cost of acquiring new weapons. Russia finds it cheaper to buy Iranian drones, for example, because the built-in cost of bribes and kickbacks make Russian-built drones too expensive to build and buy. This all adds up to a military with a thoroughly rotten core and very little proficiency. Putin, who surrounded himself by yes-men that he can control, was aware of some corruption. Such is the way in Russia. 
but he had no idea just how poorly prepared his troops were for real combat operations. This is where he is both at fault and not at fault, because while he couldn't have known, it is also his fault that the Russian military is as corrupt as it is. Having perpetuated the same culture of corruption that brought him to power, he should have hardly found it surprising that everyone up the entire chain of command was also enthusiastically engaging in it as well, hollowing out his military forces. Putin believed that he'd be able to take Kyiv in three days after seeing the brutal speed of American combined arms operations in Afghanistan and Iraq. However, Putin had miscalculated just how poorly prepared the Russian military was, both in terms of basic competency and logistics. It doesn't help that Putin appears to remain largely blind to the troubled state of his own military, as defectors with close access to the dictator have confirmed that he watches no media except Russian state media, and he doesn't even browse the internet. This means we won't be getting a very special subscriber from the heart of the Kremlin, but on the other hand, that might be a good thing because the bigger Putin's miscalculations, the faster he ushers in the defeat of the Russian military and his own downfall. It's been a harsh, harsh winter for Russian troops. As the snow melts and the spring sunshine starts to defrost the ground, Ukrainians are planting flags and celebrating. Crimea is theirs, something no one thought possible just a few months before. Do you think it's an outrageous thing to say, hear us out, and then make up your mind at the end? Ukrainians had cause to celebrate after their armed forces took back the city of Kherson in November after the most successful counteroffensive of the war. Early in September, Putin had declared the annexation of Kherson and the regions of Luhansk, Donetsk, and Zaporizhia in southern Ukraine. The loss of Kherson city and other territories close by hurt Putin, given its proximity to Crimea. The Russians had been there for just six weeks before they were sent packing, with Ukrainians joyfully putting flags back up that the Russians had taken down during their occupation. On November 9th, Russia's general of the army, Sergei Sorovikin, said the military was leaving. Two days later, the Russian Ministry of Defense said all troops and equipment had been removed from the area without any major issues. That might not have been the truth. Reports later surfaced that Russia had struggled to get its 40,000 troops to safety, never mind its equipment, which was quickly captured by the advancing Ukrainian troops. People hailed the victory as a tectonic shift in the war. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said it was a historic day. Kherson had been the only major city the Russians had managed to take, and now they'd run away with their tails between their legs. The videos of the soldiers retreating in single file were nothing short of shameful for Putin, who'd really not expected this to happen. With this defeat, Crimea was suddenly looking a lot more vulnerable. What's perhaps more shameful is that Russia had to blow up a main bridge after they'd crossed it, presumably worried Ukraine could use it to engage in hot pursuit. It's also telling that since Russia had done this, they had no intention of returning, or at least not for a long time. Kherson was gone, and it wasn't coming under Russian control anytime soon. This was just weeks after Russian officials had spread propaganda about its victory there, erecting signs in the city that read, Russia is here forever. Talk about pie in your face. Soon it became known that Russia had left behind valuable equipment, including plenty of tanks, some reports stated dozens of tanks, on top of armored personnel carriers, left behind in perfectly good condition. Critics of the Kremlin's retreat, but supportive of the invasion, wrote blogs saying things like, you could have at least blown them up before you left. We think the Russian forces had something more important on their minds as they scurried off. Before the Ukrainian military entered the city, the Russians had blown up the Antonivsky Bridge that crosses the Dnipro River. Russia didn't say how it had done it or why it had done it, but we think it's pretty obvious. There's only one reason why someone purposefully burns their bridges, it's called separation, and Russia made damn sure it was final. Ukrainian residents who heard the explosion said it happened just before dawn and it made such a racket that it took them aback, even after everything that had gone on over there in the past few months. Thanks to US satellite images, we know that Russia destroyed a bunch of other crossings. That includes the Kakova Hydroelectric Dam, located about 50 miles to the north, as well as a railroad bridge, another bridge at the town of Varivka, and some more crossings. But none were as important as the Antonivsky Bridge. After Russia annexed Crimea in 2014, it sent supplies to this region over the Antonivsky Bridge. In terms of Russia's strategy in the invasion, the bridge is what you might call a big piece of the puzzle. And now Russia's blown the thing up, or at least badly damaged it, and it had made it useless regarding the transport of hardware. The unusability, though, goes both ways. Prior to Russia taking Kherson, when Ukraine began its counteroffensive in August, Ukrainian forces did everything to keep the bridge intact. They targeted Russian forces based close to the river, using long-range weapons sent from the west to take out Russian command and control centers and ammunition depots. Notably, Ukraine did not want to destroy the bridge completely, but just damage it enough so Russia couldn't fully utilize it. In Ukraine's crystal ball, it saw itself one day chasing Russians back across that bridge and perhaps entering Crimea. It needed to be damaged but not destroyed. Crimea was always in Ukraine's sights. 
Russia fully understands this ambition and is currently trying its hardest to ensure Ukraine's plan never comes to fruition. Since Russia retreated from Kherson, it's been fortifying positions in the area, building defense bases that US intelligence said stretch for about 25 miles. The construction of these bases in terms of speed has been called unmatched. If Ukraine wants to liberate Crimea, it'll have one hell of a fight on its hands. Reports now say Russia has built dozens of fortifications to the east of the Dnipro River. It's built defenses along roads, main ones and smaller ones, and at various bridges and intersections. The importance of Russia keeping Crimea can't be understated, so as we said, a Ukraine advance will not be easy. Intelligence tells us that Russia has been very busy as of late, constructing anti-tank barriers, digging trenches and setting up mines on the coast of the river. The Russians have also erected so-called dragon's teeth, pyramidal structures made of concrete with the purpose of stopping military vehicles. But Ukraine has an ace in the hole in this respect. It has the US and its allies, who control the most advanced intelligence network in the world. Russia's every move is being recorded. Radar systems and other surveillance tech show Ukraine Russia's weak spots. It exposes Russia's strategy. Every position they take is being analyzed. The British intelligence agency recently said Russia's new fortifications might not be enough to hold Ukraine back. The agency said the fortifications are old school and won't work in a modern conflict. It explained, These structures align with traditional military trench plans that have remained largely unchanged since World War II. Such structures are likely to be vulnerable to accurate strikes from modern weapons. Ukraine has no shortage of such weapons, being spoiled with elaborate military packages that can make a US taxpayer cry. So, Ukraine has all the intelligence it needs to assess Russia's positions and plan against Russian strategies. It also has long and short-range weapons thanks to the Western war industry. And now we're being told that Russia is prepared to defend Crimea in ways that would not have looked out of place at the start of the 20th century. But Russia has another setback, which everyone's talking about. Russia's Achilles heel, or at least one of them, is the fact that it's using mobilized troops. In a few of our shows, you've heard how such troops have been sent to fight, with only the most basic training. Many men have refused to fight, complaining of being used as cannon fodder and not even receiving the right equipment to protect themselves. Discipline among troops has been a problem for Russia, which will undoubtedly affect how well a Ukrainian advance towards Crimea can be repulsed. Discipline might not be such an important factor if Russia gets its way, which in part is to use the fortifications to drive the Ukrainians into narrow paths where they'll be bombarded with missiles and artillery. Russian hackers have also been able at times to collect information on US-Ukraine war strategy. As a Carnegie report recently stated, Russian hackers might still have a larger impact if they can collect high-value intelligence that Moscow then leverages effectively. There's a genuine threat that Russian hackers will get their hands on more top-secret information which will help Russia target Ukrainian forces, possibly where important Western weapon systems are being used. They might hack and then leak information that'll expose Ukraine's combat losses and negatively affect how the Western public and Ukrainian public feel about this war. Russia will keep attacking Ukraine's infrastructure, and any leaks that show military weakness will certainly drive nails into the Ukrainian public's confidence. So many people are already suffering, and as the winter goes on, they will suffer more. This is why this winter might be a trying time for Ukraine and its allies, especially if the Russians start leaking information that doesn't exactly make the West and Ukraine look great. Russia might just stop there, waiting, embracing a war of attrition, destroying more and more infrastructure and using its cyber intelligence to its full potential. It doesn't help Ukraine that, to move forward, it might have to trudge through swampland. Progress won't be easy, and any such push will also mean Ukraine has supply issues to contend with. Russia wants to keep as active as possible on the other fronts of the war, such as in Bakhmut, where it's seen some success. Still, this winter could be devastating for Russian troops if Ukraine gets its way and destroys the supply lines that are delivering Russia its diesel. This precious commodity doesn't only power military vehicles, but it also makes generators run, lighting up and heating command posts and living facilities. Fuel is always essential, but if Ukraine can decrease the amount of fuel that can reach the front lines during the war, it'll really dent Russia's survival rates and confidence. You can almost hear the whispers from both sides saying in tremulous tones, Winter is coming. We're talking about a lot of fuel here, and Ukraine knows that, so it already is targeting Russia's supply lines. Fuel depots have already been destroyed by Ukrainian artillery and drones, the kind of thing that'll be more devastating if it keeps happening during the winter. This is why Russia is fighting so hard to take Bakhmut. It's vital in terms of supplies. Russia has already had quite a scare lately in terms of losing supply lines. In 2018, Russia said it was proud to have finished what it called the construction of the century. That was something of an exaggeration, but it wasn't far off. We're talking about the Crimea Bridge, aka the Kirk Bridge, which is central to Russia's war effort in terms of keeping the troops supplied. In October 2022, this pride of Putin's structure blew up. 
sending large pieces of cement into the river and killing four Russian civilians. At the time, no one knew really what happened, but word on the street was that a truck had driven over the bridge carrying a large explosive. Russia called it terrorism and blamed Ukraine, but the truth behind the explosion has yet to come out. This was another massive blow for Putin, who wasn't just bugged about losing a supply route, but also disheartened when he heard that such a symbolic structure was in flames. He can smile now, since it's largely been repaired after a massive effort by Russian engineers and workers. A British engineer told the BBC, A bridge has certainly been repaired much quicker than the timescales common in civilian engineering projects. The reason is, this multi-billion dollar bridge, the longest in Europe at 12 miles, also has valuable rail lines which were badly damaged. Two tracks and four roads connect Russia to Crimea and are used to deliver a huge amount of goods, arms, and equipment to the region. The bridge doesn't just help supply the people of Crimea with fuel and food, but it's essential for transporting weapons and personnel to Ukraine. Making it not very useful for a while upset the balance of the war. It's not certain just how much of it is totally fixed right now, although some sources say there's still work to be done, and with winter making it hard to work, Russia might have to wait until the spring to finish the repairs. This could be problematic. The bridge is important, but Ukraine has also attacked another strategically vital city in terms of supplies, Melitopol. Not only is the fighting here an effort to push the Russians out of southern Ukraine, but Melitopol is known as the gateway to Crimea. Victory here could ensure Ukraine takes back the entire Zaporizhia region and what's left of Russian-occupied Kherson, so this could also become the path to taking back Crimea. In mid-December, Ukraine forces damaged a bridge crossing the Molochna River. They later killed Russian soldiers in barracks, although as this show is being made, Russia is still in Melitopol. Reports are stating that what happened in Kherson could happen in Melitopol, which might have occurred by the time you see the show. If it does happen, it's another way Crimea might soon be back in Ukraine's hands. But as with the Kherson offensive, it'll still be very hard. An official for the Biden administration recently said it was possible. Still, analysts worry that if Putin did lose Crimea, it might be the trigger that made the madman use nuclear bombs. Some say a line needs to be crossed for him to do that, and that line is Crimea. But as we said, in spite of Ukraine's wins and Russia's perhaps vulnerable fortifications, pushing into Crimea will always be a daunting task. Even so, Russia has built those fortifications all the way back to Crimea, so it must be expecting Ukraine to try and advance that far. The threat is very much real. With almost daily news of Ukrainian advances in the war, it's clear that Russia is on the back foot. But despite all the gains Ukraine continues to make, as President Zelensky has stated, the country will not stop until it retakes all occupied lands, Crimea included. However, some military experts predict that if Ukraine were to retake Crimea, it would signal the fall of Putin and his regime within a few years. But how could Ukraine retaking Crimea tear Russia apart like that? Before we begin, we should be clear, we're not going to delve into the if, how, or when Ukrainian forces could retake Crimea. With so much debate around that topic, this is best reserved for another time. For the sake of this video, we'll assume that Ukraine has successfully conquered Crimea and analyze the political ramifications that would follow. With these formalities out of the way, let's first debunk a few myths about why Crimea is important to Russia, and then get into the real reason why losing Crimea would destroy Putin's regime. For those unfamiliar with the geography of Crimea, it's the portion of Ukraine that juts out of the bottom of the country, in the north of the Black Sea. While it might look like an island, it's actually connected to Ukraine by a three-mile strip of land known as the Isthmus of Perikop. The remaining land borders, if you could call them that, are very shallow lagoons known as Sivash. These muddy marshlands could act like a footbridge between Crimea and Ukraine, since at low tide people can walk across in most areas. In fact, it is what both the Germans and the Soviets did in World War II when they attacked the peninsula. This geography is important because even though it's technically connected to Ukraine, for all intents and purposes Crimea is like a big island. The peninsula relies heavily upon imported manufactured goods, fuel, and most other necessities. While there is a bustling agricultural sector on the peninsula, this relies heavily on the North Crimean Canal. The North Crimean Canal was a major public works project started by the Soviet Union in 1961 and finished in 1975. This massive canal draws its water from the Dnipro River in the Kherson Oblast and sends it to Crimea. About two-thirds of the water is used for agriculture, with the rest going between industry and public use. The canal is important because it demonstrates how economically depressed the region is. Crimea was devastated during the Second World War, and because Stalin deported most of the native Tartar population in 1944, the area was severely depopulated. With so much destruction and few people to work, Crimea has been in economic turmoil since the rule of Stalin. Since taking over Crimea in 2014, 
The Russian government has been continually pumping out data praising the huge economic growth in the region. According to Russian data, Crimea is the fastest growing economic region in Russia, with almost all sectors posing nearly triple-digit growth. The construction industry in Crimea has been the most impressive, which saw 71% growth year-over-year year by 2019. But what is startling is that despite the enormous economic growth, Crimea is among the three poorest oblasts in Russia by per capita income. How could that be with such growth across all industries? First of all, most of the construction growth was because of the Kirk Bridge that Putin and his cronies had to build to connect Crimea with mainland Russia. The other huge reason was the heavy investment in railways, bridges, port facilities, and other infrastructure in Crimea's major port, Sevastopol. With Sevastopol being the prime Russian military base in the region, the rest of the country has seen little to no investment. Because of the poor state of the Crimean economy, Putin has pumped in around $13 billion in direct financial aid to shore up Crimean accounts. Some economic analysts argue that this, combined with investments in the Kerch Bridge and Sevastopol, helped cause the Russian economy to retract for a few years after the annexation of Crimea. Despite the economic slump in most of the peninsula, the one industry in Crimea that is doing well is its tourism industry. With its temperate climates, beautiful scenery, and vast coastlines, Crimea has turned into the equivalent of Florida for Russia, with many wealthy retirees and those seeking better weather relocating to the region. But Russian snowbirds aren't the only people going to Crimea. It's also one of Russia's most popular vacation spots. In 2019, a record 7.2 million tourists visited Crimea, and those numbers make up about 25% of the overall number of tourists to Russia each year. Another reason why Crimea might be important is because of the exclusive economic zones that surround it. According to international law, each country is entitled to a 200 nautical mile area extending from their country's shores that gives all mineral fishing and other economic rights to that country. Known as EEZs, these are powerful pieces of real estate that give a country claims over things like oil and natural gas. And in the Black Sea, there's a lot of that. The Black Sea has several trillion cubic meters of natural gas and hundreds of millions of barrels of oil that remain untapped. Because this area was an economic backwater for the USSR, no serious attempt was made to invest in offshore drilling. Once Ukraine became independent, Western companies were weary of investing money into Ukrainian projects due to corruption and ownership disputes. With the 2014 war in the Donbass, any hope of foreign investment fell to the wayside. We have to tell you all of this because we want to make it clear that Putin's interest in Crimea isn't an economic one. Losing Crimea would not be like losing a huge economic hub. Being isolated and underdeveloped, the area is actually a drain on Russian finances. Though losing Crimea would be a huge hit to Russia's tourism industry, with the full-scale invasion in February, Russia already destroyed its own tourism industry, with many people worldwide unable to travel to or leave Russia. As for oil and natural gas deposits Russia would lose, even though they are substantial, they actually pale in comparison to what Russia produces each year. Even if all the known natural gas deposits in the Black Sea were taken out tomorrow, that would only be equivalent to what Russia could produce in a few years. Losing these deposits does little to hurt the Russian economy. The fact that Russia denies their use to Ukraine does much more to hurt the Ukrainian economy since these deposits make up about 80% of Ukraine's known Black Sea reserves. So if by losing Crimea, the Russian economy is not hurt, the tourism industry is affected but already gone, and oil and natural gas production remains practically unchanged, then how could losing it hurt Putin? The short answer is prestige. Up until 1954, Crimea was actually a part of Russia. Since being absorbed into the Russian Empire by Catherine the Great in 1783, Crimea was always a part of Russia even after the USSR was created. This all changed in 1954, when Nikita Khrushchev changed the administrative borders to have Crimea become part of Ukraine. He did that because of the North Crimean Canal. Khrushchev thought that it would be easier if the Ukrainian SSR was given control of Crimea. After all, it only made sense with the water being drawn from Ukraine. But doing this in 1954 was highly controversial and remains so to this day in Russia. This is because the people in Crimea are the least Ukrainian in the country. Until 1783, Crimea was ruled by the Mongols or their descendants. Though the name of the government might have changed a few times by the 18th century, it was part of the Ottoman Empire. Unlike Russia, which overthrew its Mongol leaders several hundred years before, Crimea remained linked to the Middle East and Asia. This long period of several hundred years of being isolated from Russia and Ukraine allowed the Tartar people to develop their own culture. With a mix of Turkish, Asian, and European influences, Tartars were unlike any other Ukrainians. 
Those ethnic Russians who moved to Crimea over the centuries adopted this mentality of being close to Russia since many did not identify with Ukraine. In fact, at the time of the 2014 annexation and the war on Donbass, Crimea was the only oblast with a majority ethnic Russian population. Data then showed that 60% of the population in Crimea were ethnic Russians, while in the Donbass this figure was just 40%. Even though the sham referendums held in Ukraine since 2014 are universally seen as illegitimate, several votes held since the breakup of the Soviet Union show that Crimeans are divided pretty equally, though slightly favor Russia overall. In the immediate aftermath of the USSR falling, just 54% of the population voted for independence from Russia, even though 91% of Ukraine as a whole wanted independence. Because of this disparity and the Russian military interests in Sevastopol, Crimea became the only oblast in Ukraine to be awarded the status of an autonomous republic with its own constitution and government. However, throughout the 90s, Crimea started to get increasingly closer to Russia. As a result, the Ukrainian parliament abolished the Crimean constitution and absolved the office of the Crimean president. After this, Russia did next to nothing to continue trying to build a separate partnership with Crimea. The failure of the Yeltsin government to secure more direct diplomatic ties during this time remained a thorn in Putin's side until he annexed the region in 2014. Over the next 20 years, Crimea continued to show favoritism toward Russia. The region always voted for pro-Russian Ukrainian presidents, including an overwhelming majority for Viktor Yanukovych. Yanukovych was the president who backed out of letting Ukraine join the EU, and whose bloody crackdown on protests started the Euromaidan revolution that brought true democracy to Ukraine. In the eyes of the Russian people, due to the hundreds of years of history of being together and their continued interests in being closer to Russia since the USSR fell, they see Crimea as part of Russia. The fact that Khrushchev made what seemed like a simple administrative change 70 years ago meant everything when these administrative borders became codified international borders in the 90s. Russians feel that the only thing making Crimea part of Ukraine is this arbitrary decision and that it could not erase hundreds of years of history and culture between the two. According to independent studies, seeing Putin bring Crimea back into Russian control was hugely popular, with about 70% of the population supporting it. The Russian military has also hugely supported the move. Since the 18th century, Sevastopol has been a major naval base. Over time, Sevastopol has grown from a naval base to hosting many airfields, depots, army bases, and missile sites. Additionally, Sevastopol remains the only viable warm water port under Russian control within its own borders. Though Russian authorities have tried to build up ports like Novorossiysk or secured basing rights in occupied parts of Georgia, these ports don't compare to the size and scale of Sevastopol. Not only does occupying Sevastopol provide the military with a year-round warm water port, it also denies the use of it to NATO forces. Were Crimea ever to fall and Ukraine join NATO, NATO warships would likely be based out of there. Controlling Crimea means that this scenario never has a chance to materialize, and if it did, it would be a huge strategic failure for Russia. Controlling Crimea is also a key source of pride for the Russian military. The peninsula has been home to Russia's Black Sea Fleet for hundreds of years. With generations upon generations of military members serving there, abandoning it would be like a slap in the face to those who see Crimea as a sort of ancestral homeland of the Russian Navy and to a lesser extent the army. If Ukraine seized Crimea, Putin would be in serious trouble. First of all, he might suffer a loss in the information space he could not recover from. Russia's people overwhelmingly see Crimea as historically and by law a part of Russia, and the Russian military universally believes this idea. Losing Crimea would showcase how weak of a leader Putin really is because he could not protect a small, easily defensible area the size of Massachusetts. It would make people wonder how he could defend mainland Russia from an attack from the West. The loss would also make him easily comparable to his predecessor Yeltsin. Seen as weak and unable to stand up for himself, losing Crimea would be seen as returning to a dark part of Russian history, where it seemed that people were taking advantage of the country. This dissatisfaction ultimately won Putin the office in the first place, so losing Crimea would be seen as going backward, not forwards. Losing Crimea would also severely undermine any future military operations to force new territories into Russian control. A loss of Crimea would entail huge losses of personnel and equipment for Russia in the ensuing battle. Not only would these losses hugely affect overall force readiness, but it would send a message to everyone else that if the Russians can't hold on to Crimea, they can't hold on to any other territories. Regions outside Ukraine and under Russian occupation like Chechnya, Ingushetia, North Ossetia, Transnistria, and Abkhazia could see an overthrow of Russian control in Crimea as their time to rise while Russia is weak. 
Other regions in eastern and southern Russia, such as marginalized ethnic minorities, could use this as an opportunity not to rise up in armed conflict, but seek greater political independence from the Russian Federation. A military loss in Crimea would almost certainly mean increased domestic military and political conflict. Combined with the irreversible damage to his prestige, Putin's regime would crumble under its own weight, as Russian civilians, military members, and repressed communities all universally detest Putin for one reason or another. A Ukrainian sniper peers through the scope of his rifle. Half a mile away, a Russian armored vehicle rolls down a dirt road. The shooter blinks hard to clear his vision. He takes a deep breath and holds it to steady his aim. Before he squeezes the trigger, he glances to the side at the device strapped to his arm to get a reading on the wind speed and direction. At this distance, every variable counts. He runs through a set of calculations in his head, adjusts his aim, and fires. Seconds pass. The enemy vehicle begins to slow down and then comes to a complete stop. The sniper looks through his scope and chuckles. The Russian vehicle is bellowing smoke. The incendiary round he just fired smashed through the vehicle's armor and ignited the fuel in its tank. Even from half a mile away, he hit his mark dead on. He records his shot and the destruction of the vehicle, packs up his rifle and moves to the next target. This isn't a unique story. Ukrainian snipers have been wreaking havoc on the Russians since the start of the war, and this isn't the only way they're making conscripts scared for their lives. The scenario we just talked about is likely how one Ukrainian Special Forces soldier managed to incapacitate a Russian armored vehicle in the summer of 2022. It was an incredible shot that cost Russia an armored vehicle and Ukraine the price of a bullet. Ukrainian military officials reported that the sniper hit the Russian BMP-2 amphibious armored vehicle from a distance of around 754 meters or 2,500 feet. The reason the shot is so impressive is because of the skills of the sniper, the weapon used, and the armor-piercing incendiary rounds that were used. The precise shot hit the gas tank of the BMP-2, and the heat from the incendiary round caused the fuel to catch fire. This particular vehicle was designed to carry troops into battle and provide fire support once the soldiers were deployed. After the sniper shot, all that was left was scrap metal. It's not clear whether the Russian soldiers in the vehicle made it out alive, but even if they did, the Ukrainian sniper would have been waiting for them. That same sniper unit also took out another armored vehicle by hitting the engine compartment several times with armor-piercing rounds. It might sound crazy, but this one Ukrainian sniper was able to disable two Russian armored vehicles and take out several soldiers before falling back to resupply. Think about what a massive blow to the Russian war effort that would be. Each of the armored vehicles disabled by the sniper cost Russia millions of dollars, and in a matter of seconds, they were rendered useless by a single sniper. Russia has fallen back to the territory they already controlled in Ukraine to regroup and resupply after suffering significant casualties at the hands of the Ukrainian military. One of the main reasons that the Russian army is having such a hard time invading further into Ukraine is because of Ukraine's skilled snipers. Let's take a look at some truly incredible accomplishments achieved by these special forces units. Taking a tank out from 2,500 feet away is very impressive, but there are other shots that have been made during the war that are even more remarkable. Before we dive into some more insane Ukrainian sniper missions, we need to understand why their snipers are so effective. The story of many of the soldiers causing so much havoc amongst the Russian tanks might be more peculiar than you think. In fact, many of the sniper units deployed across the country to stop the Russian invasion are made up of young people who felt it was their duty to fight for their country. There are definitely snipers who were trained as Ukrainian special forces, and they conduct most of the high-profile missions to take out key targets, but there's another contingent of snipers that have also joined the fight. Ukrainian men and women who left their homes to work in Western Europe, where there were more opportunities, came back to fight for their country when the war started. Many Ukrainians felt it was their duty to take up arms and defend their nation when Russia invaded. People still living within Ukraine's borders quickly transitioned from their ordinary jobs and lives into becoming full-blown soldiers. Obviously, not everyone had the skill set to become a sniper, but those who did came from some surprising places. Engineers, students, and entrepreneurs raced back to Ukraine to join the war effort. In order to ramp up their training, makeshift sniper ranges were constructed outside of Kyiv where anyone who had proficiency with rifles or hunting could be trained. These out-of-the-ordinary training tactics seem to have worked, as now Ukrainian snipers are one of the biggest threats to Russian soldiers. Many of the volunteer snipers have honed their deadly skills through countless hours of trial and error. Ukrainian military leaders head the war effort, but when snipers are out in the field, they oftentimes need to make their own decisions. However, since the objective of every soldier and civilian in Ukraine is to push the Russians out of the country, the decision of whether to pull the trigger or not is almost always an easy one to make. Ukrainians who have traveled from abroad to get back to their country to take up arms against the Russian invasion forces have had to overcome numerous obstacles even before reaching a training center. Just getting back into Ukraine is easier said than done. Due to Russian hostilities, all flights into or out of the country have been grounded. 
The last thing Ukraine wants is for civilian passengers to be shot down by Russian missiles, and the truly terrible part is that it wouldn't be that surprising. Russia has already targeted numerous civilian structures and vehicles and has killed indiscriminately as they try to push further into Ukraine. This means that Ukrainians who have come back to fight have had to fly into cities like Budapest, then pay huge amounts of money to hire a driver to get them across the border so they can enlist with the military. Sometimes they show up with their own rifles that were procured before returning to Ukraine. One future volunteer sniper received a call from his mother on February 24, 2022. She told her son the war had started and she could hear helicopters, airplanes, and explosions all around her. It was at that point the young man decided he needed to return to fight. He bought a US-made sniper rifle, started training with the special forces instructor that his friends connected him with, and then snuck into Ukraine to wage war against Russian forces. Once back in the country, he reached Kyiv, where he formally enlisted in the military, received expedited training, and joined a sniper unit. Ukraine is winning the war against Russia, but they do not have access to all the weapons and resources they need to push them out of the country at the moment. This is why many volunteer snipers come to fight with their own equipment. A large percentage of Ukrainians are familiar with rifles from engaging in hunting before the war. Now these skills are being leveraged to create more deadly soldiers. Surprisingly, some of the volunteer snipers have even cited their affinity for first-person shooter video games as a driving force to becoming a volunteer sniper. At this point, the Ukrainian military needs all the help it can get, so using any skills that will aid the sniper in the training process is a must. However, as almost every Ukrainian soldier fighting in the war has made clear, they don't want to kill people or shoot them with sniper rifles even if they are Russian. It's all out of necessity. And that drive to secure their homeland from the Russians, combined with skills learned from Special Forces sniper trainers, have led to some pretty incredible results for Ukraine. Snipers need to have complete control of their bodies and senses in order to be effective. They also need to have the skill set to use data from their scope and monitors to adjust their aim to hit targets that are extremely far away. In training, snipers are given charts that they're drilled on to ensure they can make last-minute calculations when they're in the field. To be more aware of their surroundings, they wear headphones made for hunters that suppress the noise of their rifles while amplifying any voices around them. It's this combination of pre-war skills, training, and the weapons being used that make the Ukrainian snipers so deadly. But before we tell you what gear these soldiers are using, let's hear a few more incredible stories. One Ukrainian sniper now holds the second largest combat kill ever recorded. This soldier shot an enemy from approximately 1.68 miles away. That's like trying to thread a needle with a microscopic hole while being blindfolded. Needless to say, the Ukrainian sniper expertly sighted their target, made all the right calculations, and then hit the mark with deadly accuracy. The longest kill shot ever recorded was made by a Canadian sniper in Iraq in 2017. This soldier hit their target from 2.2 miles away. This is an unbelievable distance, and the Canadian sniper must have been incredibly skilled. However, hitting a target from over a mile and a half away is no small feat either. The video of the kill shot from Ukraine shows the target using a night vision scope. The sniper lines up the shot, fires, and after the rifle steadies from the recoil, the Russian soldier goes down. The darkness of night is the Ukrainian sniper's best friend when they have night vision. The body heat coming off of Russian soldiers makes them easy to track and target. Also, darkness provides cover for the Ukrainian snipers, especially when they're firing from over a mile away. Muzzle suppressors dampen the rifle's sound and flash, making the snipers all but undetectable. One of the most incredible shots made thus far in the war definitely goes to this next sniper. A video released by official Ukrainian military channel shows the sniper's view through their scope as he hits two Russian targets with one bullet. The video itself isn't high quality due to the complications around setting up recording equipment for a scope, but what can be seen are two blob-shaped figures that were Russian seemingly talking to one another. The Ukrainian sniper aims his shot and waits for the perfect moment. After he fires and refocuses the scope, both Russian soldiers have fallen down, signifying that they were both hit by the bullet. But this isn't the only astonishing shot this sniper made. The Ukrainian military also praised this same elite gunman for taking down five Russian troops in five minutes. He was part of the 3rd Special Purpose Regiment of the Special Operations Forces of Ukraine patrolling the Donetsk region when the unit came across Russian troops. This particular engagement left three Russian soldiers dead and two wounded, and what's even crazier is that these shots were all made from over 4,000 feet away. There's no denying that Ukraine currently has some of the most skilled snipers in the world. Again, not all of these shooters went through extensive training by the military. Ukraine needs all the snipers they can muster, even if this means some of their ranks are filled with shooters who have less traditional military experience than would be desired. But the Ukrainian snipers are not just crack shots, they also play other major roles in the fight against Russia. 
Snipers are constantly used for spotting Russian positions and then calling in artillery or airstrikes. This means that shooting the gas tank or an engine block of a vehicle is not the only way that Ukrainian snipers are taking out armored vehicles and tanks. Snipers are often trained in tactical, medicine, and drone use, as these skills are oftentimes necessary to complete their mission objectives. Then again, almost all Ukrainian soldiers are trained to use multiple weapons and tactics, as they have to constantly find ways to defeat an enemy that vastly outnumbers themselves. However, snipers that can take out multiple targets with a single bullet or are able to disrupt enemy convoys from long distances are one of the reasons why Ukraine is winning the war. Now you might be wondering what type of sniper rifle Ukrainian sharpshooters favor. And although there are several different snipers being used by the Ukrainian military, there is one that is more devastating than all the rest. The Snipex Alligator is a 55-pound, 79-inch rifle that packs a huge punch. The barrel alone is 47 inches long. When the alligator fires its 57 caliber bullet, it leaves the muzzle at 3,200 feet per second. This gives the Snipex alligator an effective range of 23,000 feet. The rifle has a five-round detachable box magazine, which allows for quick reload times. But as you can tell from the insane sniper shots made by Ukrainian soldiers, they normally don't need to expend all five rounds to hit their targets. When examining the war in Ukraine right now, it seems that snipers may be one of the most vital assets for disrupting Russian plans and tactics. The ability of Ukrainian soldiers to hit targets from vast distances means they can kill enemy soldiers and incapacitate Russian armored vehicles without putting themselves in harm's way. This does not mean what they do isn't dangerous. Sniper units lay down covering fire to allow troops on the front lines to safely fall back and are sometimes left vulnerable to enemy artillery fire and heavy weapons fire. What snipers are doing in Ukraine is amazing and definitely making a difference in the way the war is going. However, if the Ukrainian military can't secure more ammunition and weapons, it won't matter how good a shots their snipers are. That's why it's imperative that NATO continues to send Ukraine aid and resupply its military. As the winter months grow colder in Ukraine, the fighting will slow down. However, there's no rest for sniper units. Every week there are more confirmed kills, as Ukrainian forces hold the Russians at bay. As the ground begins to thaw, we might see a renewed Russian offensive, and as long as the Ukrainian snipers have the supplies they need, they will be there to stop whatever Russia throws at them. In September, the Ukrainians pulled off one of the best military deception campaigns in modern history. While the world focused on the ongoing Kherson initiative that started in mid-August, the Ukrainian military was quietly preparing for its real offensive in the east. In the late evening of September 6, the Ukrainian army launched its Kharkiv offensive. That offensive resulted in the liberation of approximately 12,000 square kilometers of territory by mid-October. To put that in perspective, that's about the size of the U.S. state of Connecticut. But how did the Ukrainians deliver the worst battlefield defeat on the Russian military since World War II? The short answer to that question is thunder runs. To understand what a thunder run is, you must go back to the U.S. experience in Vietnam. During that conflict, the NVA and VC troops realized they were outgunned in terms of armored vehicles. While lacking in armored support, these communist soldiers did have something in abundance, mines. The main highways and roads from major population centers were notoriously known for their heavy presence of mines. Because of the frequent mine threat, U.S. troops had to constantly delay their convoys while they stopped and carefully scanned the ground with metal detectors. This would result in huge traffic jams as convoys would have to stop for hours at a time. Because of this, communist troops frequently attacked American convoys while they idled on the road waiting for the engineers to give them the go-ahead that it was safe to proceed. American commanders quickly realized that the old way of doing business was costing them the tactical and eventually strategic initiative. If U.S. convoys could not reliably get to where they were going, far-flung outposts would have much more difficult times resupplying, reinforcing, and communicating with larger formations. To solve this problem, American commanders devised an ingenious idea simply run the mines over. Because the M48 Patton tank could easily withstand the anti-personnel mines that lined most of Vietnam's roadways, the tactic was simple. M48 tanks would lead the way in front of convoys and run over all the mines. If a tank lost a track or sustained light damage, another tank could take its place and keep going. By employing this simple yet brutally effective tactic, the American military ensured that it could effectively navigate Vietnam's highways safely and efficiently. Fast forward almost 40 years, and America is now embroiled in the war on terror. As part of that war, the United States, under President Bush's guidance, invaded Iraq under the mistaken belief that Saddam Hussein was harboring weapons of mass destruction. While we won't get into the political debate over the legitimacy of the U.S. invasion, it's clear that it was a work of military genius on America's part, thanks in no small part to the contribution of General William Wallace. Having taken command over a V Corp shortly before the 9-11 attacks, General Wallace was a Vietnam veteran and prude student of history. 
When the U.S. study of mounted warfare in Vietnam was published in 2002, he quickly digested it and dusted off the Thunder Run as a viable tactic in the modern era with some twists. With its emphasis on speed and violence of action, it was the perfect strategy that could be applied to taking over a country. Before the invasion of Iraq kicked off, President Bush had been worried about the huge casualties that would ensue if a large-scale battle for Baghdad had happened. Frightened by the Russian experience in Chechnya, trying to take Grozny, and the US experience in Vietnam, Bush wanted to avoid a costly city battle at all costs. Thankfully for him, General Wallace approached Central Command with such a great idea that it was eventually briefed to the President who signed off on it personally. The plan was relatively simple. It started off by creating an inner and outer cordon around Baghdad to isolate the city. The city was then divided into 55 sectors. Once established, V Corps would create an armored convoy consisting of tanks and armored fighting vehicles. This convoy would then charge ahead at full speed into the city to attack pre-designated targets within these sectors as well as collect real-time intelligence on Iraqi positions and defense preparations. During the Thunder Run, the convoy would only stop to evacuate crews from any destroyed vehicles. Despite seeming like a crazy suicide mission, the Thunder Run had some serious benefits. The most important benefit was creating disorder in the enemy's rear areas. Because the US bombing campaign had already degraded Iraqi command and control, the fact that there was an American armored column inside the city center would create confusion and panic amongst the Iraqis because there was no way to tell how far into the city the Americans advanced. The second benefit was that it acted like reconnaissance in force. Even with the state-of-the-art surveillance drones and aircraft the US operated, human intelligence was still lacking. By getting American troops up close to the city, they could accurately report on enemy strength, weapons locations, morale, and other information vital to the war effort. The third benefit was that US commanders meant the operation to be a psychological operation against the Iraqi people and the government. Before and during the Thunder Runs, General Wallace had television broadcasts playing what the Saddam regime was saying about the war. By penetrating deep into Baghdad, he could prove the regime was dead wrong about the war and hopefully break the will of the Iraqis to avoid a costly house-to-house -house battle. Crazy enough, the plan worked even better than expected. After the first Thunder Run penetrated almost to the presidential palace, the second one went in and occupied it. The Iraqi soldiers were absolutely stunned, and organized resistance soon crumbled. In fact, the Thunder Run tactic was directly credited with shortening the conventional war by at least several weeks and ultimately saving hundreds if not thousands of Allied soldiers' lives. Fast forward almost another 20 years to the war in Ukraine, and the Ukrainian government is faced with a similar situation. Since the beginning of the invasion, the city of Kharkiv has been surrounded on three sides. Though the defenders of Kharkiv have been holding on, the government desired to break the siege and continue pushing eastward to eventually retake the occupied territories of Luhansk and Donetsk. However, the Ukrainian government faced a big problem, a lack of troops. Because of the ongoing Kherson offensive, the Ukrainian government diverted large numbers of its most effective troops to the Kherson region. They needed a plan to make the most out of the limited number of experienced troops they had left. Though the plan was always to make its main strike in the east, the Ukrainian government needed the Russians to believe the Kherson region was their main target. To accomplish this, they moved large numbers of combat-hardened troops to the area to crack defenses there. But while preparations were being made for the Kherson offensive, the government was secretly planning the Kharkiv offensive. During the summer, the Ukrainians moved some of their best troops into the region, including the bulk of their special forces and battle-hardened units like the 92nd Mechanized Brigade. Knowing they lacked the raw numbers to overcome Russian defenses in the area, the Ukrainian high command hoped to use speed, audacity, and aggression to counter the numerical superiority. Even though the Russians had moved the bulk of their forces away from the Kharkiv region and left mostly decimated units and National Guard units in their place, the Russian side still enjoyed a pretty steep numerical advantage. Looking at the playbook from the US invasion of Iraq, the Ukrainian government decided to replicate the Thunder Run tactic but on a much bigger scale. The basic plan was this. The attack would come from three different directions, with one being launched from the east, one in the north, and one in the south. The northerly and southerly advances were to advance in that general direction, while the easterly advance would have the most difficult task. The eastern advance would have to break the back of the Russian defensive positions and generate enough panic to create a general route. Once the Ukrainians had created a general route, conventional units would follow up behind and hold the liberated territory. As for the columns themselves, they were instructed not to stop and keep advancing as far as they could go. To accomplish this, the columns were outfitted with tanks, armored vehicles, and civilian 4x4s that were meant to act as reconnaissance elements of the convoy. Over the course of several months, Ukrainian forces quietly accumulated all the equipment and personnel needed for the offensive. 
With a little over 10,000 troops and several hundred vehicles, the attackers would have to rely on speed and surprise to win the day, and that is exactly what they did. Late in the evening of September 6, the Eastern Column made up of Special Forces troops and the 92nd Mechanized Brigade left their starting point in the village of Praishib. After navigating the country roads, they quickly fell on their first target, the village of Virbivka, about 9 kilometers away. After a short but fierce fight, the Russians fled, and the column did not stop until they got to their next target of Balaklia, five kilometers away. This is an important area since it's a crossroads for several major regional highways and has a rail hub. Controlling this ensured Russian troops could not move freely to reinforce crumbling positions. After taking Balaklia, the convoy rumbled toward the villages of Volokivyar and Semenivka. Both of these villages were located along the T-2110 highway. The convoy continued advancing through the night and linked up with the National Guard units in the village of Shevchenkov. In just 36 hours of fighting, the column had gone an impressive 53 kilometers, and it wasn't stopping anytime soon. Once they wrestled control of the village, the convoy moved along the P07 highway, and they continued on to liberate several more villages along that highway, including the town of Rushivka. Here it was evident that the Russian forces were in full retreat having abandoned tons of military equipment and supplies in the village to escape the area with their lives. The convoy continued on its primary objective to Kupyansk. The city had served as a significant logistical and command and control center for the Kharkiv region. After linking up with conventional troops, Ukrainian forces liberated the town by the evening of September 10th. In just four days, the Eastern Column had advanced an impressive 90 kilometers and liberated five villages and two cities by itself. The operation was an astounding success. As the Institute for the Study of War documented by September 10th, the entire Russian army in the region was in a complete rout. The poorly equipped, led, and motivated troops fled for their lives without knowing where the Ukrainians would strike next. The defeat was so bad, its aftermath is what directly caused Putin to conduct his partial mobilization, resulting in 300,000 men being conscripted into the Russian military. But despite seeming like a no-brainer on paper, the operation was still very high risk. For example, Despite sending in some of the best troops Ukraine could muster, these troops were still highly isolated along the highways and villages. If the Russians had decided to put up a big enough fight, the convoys could have gotten bogged down and ultimately wiped out if Russian commanders had gotten reinforcements to the area on time. Additionally, the convoys enjoyed little air and artillery support. Though the Ukrainian Air Force still remains viable, it cannot commit its forces to a coordinated ground support role for an offensive operation. The rapid advance also meant that the convoys would quickly outrun the range of most friendly artillery systems by the end of the third or fourth a day. Essentially, the Ukrainians hoped and actually achieved complete operational and tactical surprise. Russian commanders had been focused on the ongoing Kherson initiative and left the area around Kharkiv depleted of experienced troops and most heavy equipment. Russian forces behind the immediate front lines around Kharkiv were just trying to get their feet wet or recover in an area of the front that was less active. Instead, the gamble paid off and the Ukrainian thunder runs absolutely stunned the Russian defenders. It appears that the Ukrainians employed the tried-and-true US tactic to a T and made it better by scaling it up to a much larger battlefield application. But despite being so successful, it's yet to be seen if Ukraine will replicate this winning strategy elsewhere in the country. As of right now, anything can happen. The United States is the world's premier military power, fielding advanced equipment and superior doctrine that no other nation can hope to match. But if World War III kicked off today, the US would be out of combat equipment within months. This is the lesson that the Department of Defense has learned from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Our stockpiles aren't big enough, and all that high-tech equipment turns into a massive liability very quickly in a prolonged conflict. Both Russia and Ukraine are feeling the squeeze after half a year of high-tempo combat operations. Russia has lost hundreds of vehicles, and it's estimated that it'll take 10 years just to replace the losses in heavy equipment it's suffered so far. Ukraine is burning through 3,000 artillery shells a day, with Russia using up to an estimated 20,000 shells a day. Both sides have already burned through their initial supply stocks. Ukraine has had half a million shells provided by NATO countries to supplement their stockpiles. Meanwhile, Russia has had to dip into its reserves not allocated or expected to be used in this conflict, putting it into a perilous position and forcing it to turn to North Korea for resupply. But the Hermit Kingdom is unlikely to supply much past a few weeks' worth of ammunition. As it too has a great need for vast reserves of artillery, the only weapon with which it can effectively threaten South Korea and its American allies. Modern war consumes hardware and ammunition at truly frightening rates, especially when peer or near-peer adversaries are facing off against each other. 
In the 1973 Yom Kippur War, Israel lost 400 of its 1,700 tank stockpile, losing an average of 1.1% of its entire tank force every single day of the combat. The Arab forces faced far worse, losing up to 2,300 tanks or a whopping 63% of their tank force in just 20 days of fighting. During the Battle of Kursk in World War II, Germany lost 14% of its tank forces every single day over two weeks, forcing it to call in reserves and ultimately losing 10% over the initial force. On the American side, the average infantry battalion lost 2.6% of its men every day, requiring intense and continued resupply. But in a modern global war, replacing manpower is infinitely cheaper than replacing hardware. The United States today fields 11 armored brigade combat teams, each with approximately 87 Abrams, most of them upgraded to the latest variant. Assuming a loss of just 1% per day, 9.57 Abrams would be destroyed, abandoned, receive enough battle damage to require repair back home, or captured by the enemy. By the second month of high-intensity combat ops, the U.S. Army would be down to half of its original tank forces, requiring it to dip into its reserve of 2,300 Abrams. That might sound like a significant number that should see the U.S. through a lengthy engagement, but most of these tanks are very old models, hailing back from the late Cold War. With smaller cannons, antiquated fire control, and less capable armor, these Abrams would not have the capability of modern variants. The only bright side is that the enemy would likely be seeing severe attrition as well. Thus, those old Abrams would likely be facing equally old threats such as the T-72s, leveling the playing field a bit. Currently, the U.S. Army only has plans to produce 22 brand new tanks in the fiscal year of 2023, with 30 being produced in 24 and 53 in 2025. The reason for these dismal figures is twofold. First, the U.S. Army is still busy upgrading active Abrams to the latest SEP package. Secondly, the Army is having to make some hard choices on production of new hardware versus funding new technologies needed to maintain America's unparalleled edge in combat. The rate of technology acquisition is vastly outstripping our ability to manufacture hardware. And when it comes to modern war, there's nothing worse than showing up to today's fight and yesterday's tank. Just ask the Russians, who are now being forced to show up not in yesterday's tank but last month's tank. But it's not just the swiftly evolving nature of technology that's a problem, it's that all that tech is incredibly expensive. Adjusted for inflation, an M48 Patton, America's first generation main battle tank, cost $2.8 million to produce back in World War II. Meanwhile, a fully modern Abrams cost nearly four times as much at $9 million. In the Second World War, it would take $252 million to fully equip a modern equivalent armored brigade combat team, while today it takes $810 million. Even the U.S.'s massive defense budget can't support that type of spending for a long time. And this is only tanks because the U.S. Army has a plethora of other big-ticket items needed for it to maintain its unchallenged domination of the battlefield. The vaunted Apache attack helicopter costs over $30 million a unit, and even the average infantry soldier is now equipped with anywhere between ten dollars and $18,000 worth of high-tech gear. If the Army wants to continue being the most technologically advanced force in the world, it needs to make sacrifices in order to fund new technologies, and that means dramatically slashing the physical production of hardware in favor of research and development costs for tomorrow's war. But that leaves the United States in serious risk of not having enough equipment to fight today's war. The Department of Defense predicts it can ramp up production on modern Abrams to about 20 a month if it needed to, which is a great improvement over today's dismal annual figures. However, that means it can only replace about two days' worth of combat losses every single month. It doesn't take long to figure out that after three to four months of hard fighting, the primary vehicle of the U.S. Army is not going to be the tank, but rather much cheaper to produce gun trucks and the like. In 2018, the Army asked Congress for extra money to buy 150,000 artillery shells in order to be prepared for high-intensity combat ops. As Ukraine has taught us all by now, that number is absurdly low, forcing the Department of Defense to question just how many bombs, missiles, and shells it really needs to keep on supply at all times. With nearly a million shells given to Ukraine so far, U.S. reserves are starting to wane. And artillery shells aren't things you can just keep on a shelf indefinitely. While they are infinitely simpler than, say, a precision-guided missile, a 155mm shell still has a shelf life of about 20 years. That means that all of our vast reserves from the Cold War, when we were prepared to fight a true high-intensity conflict, are all gone by now, along with the industrial capacity to replace them. And that's America's biggest problem in waging another high-intensity war. We can't build things anymore. 
In 1993, after the fall of the Soviet Union, the White House had a famous Last Supper with representatives from dozens of different major defense contractors. The message relayed to them was simple, half of you are going to go out of business. Sure enough, over the next five years, the defense industry was forced to consolidate, with a huge amount of mergers and some contractors simply going out of business entirely. All those mergers meant factories were also being shut down, and eventually sold off or torn down for real estate. Restarting wartime production isn't as simple as just reopening old factories that simply don't exist anymore, nor as easy as simply expanding production at the factories that do remain. Back in World War II, automobile manufacturers were able to switch from making cars to making tanks with only moderate difficulties. Today's tanks, however, are far more technologically advanced, requiring not just specialized tools to build them, but highly trained and educated individuals as well. Rosie the Riveter won't be showing up to a Ford factory today to build an Abrams, though five months later she might indeed be welding armor plates onto Ford pickup trucks because that's the only vehicle the US can rush out to combat troops in dire need. To further add to U.S. difficulties, consolidation of the defense industry has led to many single points of failure in its acquisitions chain. For example, only a single contractor provides electronic screens for U.S. aircraft, and only a single company can repair the Navy's propellers. This leaves the U.S. extremely vulnerable to disruption due to attacks or sabotage. So, if we know that the U.S. is not ready for a high-intensity war, why don't we just invest in increased manufacturing capability now in case we need it tomorrow? The problem with this is that the US government does not like to spend money that it doesn't see an immediate return on. Building a new tank plant that is just going to be mothballed until a major war starts will cost billions and not see any return on that investment until a major war actually happens. Instead, the US government would prefer to put that money to direct use by funding new technology or upgrading old equipment. Empty factories are expensive and require high maintenance costs, but we get nothing out of it in return until we absolutely need it. It's a risk-reward ratio that's highly disfavorable for the U.S. military. The U.S. isn't completely doomed, however, as these severe rates of attrition are only applicable in peer or near-peer conflicts. The force that does exist today is so extremely capable that it might never suffer such extreme losses. During Desert Storm, the U.S. and its allies faced the world's fourth-largest military with one of the densest air defense networks in the world. But revolutionary technologies such as GPS and precision-guided munitions allowed America to absolutely rout the Iraqi military at a cost that's frankly absurdly small. The entire coalition suffered only 31 tanks destroyed or disabled, while Iraq had 3,300 tanks destroyed. The U.S. military superiority carried the day, inflicting such an incredible defeat on a Soviet-trained and equipped military that the Soviet Union and China both immediately threw their old war plans out the window and rushed to develop new ones to counter the US. Ten years later, during the second invasion of Iraq, the US was able to decimate the Iraqi military with only five divisions, a figure that nearly everyone at the Department of Defense warned would lead to battlefield catastrophe. However, once again, advancement in technology had made smaller, nimble US forces far superior to even greater Iraqi numbers. Today, the only near-peer opponent the US faces is China. And while China is shaping up to be a capable foe, it's still unknown just how well China could fare in modern war. Its last war was in the 1970s against Vietnam, and it lost that conflict. If the US's doctrinal and technological edge holds, then perhaps there's no need for vast amounts of equipment reserves. The fact that America enjoys a whole host of global allies and partners also means that in any major conflict, it's going to bring a lot of friends to the fight, while its opponents will struggle to find any. Perhaps we've finally seen the end of major conflicts due to America's massive edge in a largely united world order. But if we haven't, the United States risks fighting World War III in gun trucks and other low-tech solutions that might spell disaster. As it stands, that disaster is more likely than ever. F-16s are finally being sent to Ukraine, and the Fighting Falcon will go toe-to-toe -to -toe with its Cold War rival, the MiG-29. The MiG-29 Fulcrum was developed in response to new American jets like the F-15 and F-16, and they would finally meet in the skies after German reunification. The East German Air Force retained a number of the Soviet-built MiG-29s, and these proved to be an intelligence goldmine for the West, who were very quickly realizing they over-engineered the crap out of the F-15. But what about the F-16, the backbone of NATO forces? Was it a significant cut above the MiG-29 as well? NATO would get its answer in May of 1995 when the 510th Fighter Squadron of the 31st Fighter Wing based in Aviano, Italy, flew up against the Luftwaffe Jagdgeschwader 73 of the new unified German Air Force. 
The fulcrums had been deployed to Dechi Momanu Air Base and presented an opportunity for mock air combat between the two fighters for the first time. The first thing to stand out to both sides was the fulcrum's impressive low-speed maneuverability, compared by one of the American pilots to fighting an F-18 Hornet. However, the fulcrum, he noted, has a thrust advantage over the Hornet. The thrust advantage allowed the fulcrums to regain energy faster and made it more difficult for the smaller F-16 to exploit strategies it might employ against an F-18 where it forced it to trade speed for maneuverability. The helmet-mounted sight system of the MiG-29 proved a significant challenge to the F-16s though, who were forced to dump flares anytime they got within the 45-degree nose cone of the MiG-29. The helmet-mounted sight was a significant game-changer for fighter jets, and after Soviet MiG-21s and MiG-23s were downed by the South African Air Force using locally developed helmet-mounted sights in the 1970s, the Soviet Union created a crash program to develop a counter to the South African tech. This would result in the helmet-mounted display and a high off bore sight missile, the R-73. Fielded in 1985, the MiG-29 included both systems, allowing Soviet pilots to fire missiles in the direction they were physically turning their heads toward. This 45-degree cone gave the MiG-29 an immediate advantage over traditional fighters, which needed to keep their opponent within a much smaller forward-facing cone of their own, and it made the MiG-29 deadly in a dogfight. Coupled with its great thrust output and maneuverability, the MiGs were proving to be a challenge for the F-16s. As told by Lt. Col. Gary West, commander of the 510th, the MiG-29's helmet-mounted sight was seen as an insurmountable challenge in close-quarters dogfighting, so the F-16s were better served avoiding it altogether. However, the Americans quickly found ways of neutralizing the Soviet plane's advantage. The F-16, a smaller, lighter plane, enjoys a significant advantage at higher speeds, coupled with excellent maneuverability of its own. Thus, the Americans found that as long as they kept their airspeed at around 325 knots, they could outmaneuver the MiG-29s and negate the advantage of its helmet-mounted sight. Once the Americans and the Germans swapped planes, the weaknesses of the MiG-29 further came to light. The plane was not nearly as nimble as the F-16, and its visibility is also terrible. An F-16 pilot sits high in the cockpit with a bubble canopy that gives them the ability to see 360 degrees around them. The MiG-29, meanwhile, has much less visibility. In the words of one of the Fulcrum pilots, our visibility is not as good as an F-16 or even an F-15. We can't see directly behind us. We have to look out the side slightly to see behind us, which doesn't allow us to maintain a visual contact and an optimum lift vector at the same time. This shortcoming can be a real problem, especially when flying against an aircraft as small as the F-16. The aircraft was formidable but not a good dogfighter. As explained by the German operations officer of the MiG-29 squadron, the airplane was flown like a point defense interceptor similar to the MiG-21. Even though it could perform in a close-in dogfight, it wasn't designed for it, hence the canopy visibility issue. Instead, the Germans were trained by Soviet instructors to simply fly the plane as an interceptor, taking off, jettisoning the fuel tank, going supersonic, firing missiles, and then going home. This naturally was a significant flaw in the Soviet air doctrine, which relegated its air forces to fighting long-range skirmishes supported by ground-based air defenses. NATO forces, meanwhile, trained to achieve air superiority and then hold it. From a logistical point of view, it made sense. NATO had better aircraft with better avionics and sensors, and the Soviets knew that they would never win an air war if their air force went toe-to-toe -to -toe with NATO's. However, by tying in ground-based air defenses and keeping the Soviet air force within range, the Soviet Union hoped to keep airspace directly over the front lines relatively safe for ground forces. Ultimately, this would prove a significant flaw with the revelation brought on by Desert Storm when American forces executed their deep strike doctrine, flying deep behind the front lines to attack support and logistical targets, evading or destroying ground-based air defenses. Then there's the recent revelations brought on by the war in Ukraine. To date, Russia has downed nearly as many of its own aircraft as Ukraine has. This is due to a lack of competency in operating ground-based air defenses alongside active air forces. In Desert Storm, the US and its allies operated hundreds of air defenses with thousands of aircraft overhead, resulting in only a handful of friendly shootdowns. By comparison, Russia today is operating in a theater twice the size with about a quarter of the aircraft and has suffered dozens of friendly shootdowns. This includes the incredible shootdown of four aircraft in one day inside of Russia's own borders. The Soviet military was believed to be more competent than the modern Russian one, but there are significant doubts as to its true capabilities given the legacy it passed down to the Russian Federation. Back to the fight, though. American pilots found that the MiG-29 could be very dangerous in the initial stages of a tight dogfight. However, soon the F-16's superior maneuverability and light weight could be used to gain the energy advantage. But that was in the mid-1990s. How would the MiG-29 fare today? 
A Polish pilot who has flown both the MiG-29 and F-16 recently spoke to the media, stating that he would not like to fly the MiG-29 in real combat if given the choice. With five years' experience in both aircraft, the Polish pilot pointed out that even small advantages add up to significant outcomes. The F-16's cockpit was designed with pilot comfort in mind, with instruments laid out in a convenient way that makes flying the aircraft much easier to the pilot. In his own words, this type of design philosophy simply did not exist in the Soviet Union. Aircraft were built to utilitarian standards, and no thought was given to how a pilot's comfort or even the ease of operating various instruments could result in an advantage in a fight. Then again, the Soviets may have seen the MiG-29 as an interceptor meant to undertake 30-minute sorties, getting into the sky, shooting its missiles, and immediately going back home. The F-16 is also a much smarter aircraft. Its radar can track and engage multiple targets simultaneously, and its ability to link up to friendly tactical battle networks vastly improves the F-16's situational awareness. Friendly aircraft can feed each other information, and friendly platforms like AWACS can give the F-16 pilot an unprecedented picture of the battle space. Superior radar lets the F-16 find targets on its own and engage them at long ranges. The MiG-29, by comparison, was completely reliant on ground radar controllers to find targets, with its own radar only suitable for a short-range flight and with the ability to lock onto and track only a single target at a time. When the Polish pilot flew his MiG-29, he also never had the opportunity to utilize night vision goggles, while with the F-16s, they're part of standard equipment. When it comes to self-defense, the MiG-29's radar warning receiver provides very little information to the pilot on the potential threat, making it difficult to ascertain what the threat is and how to best react to it. This significantly lowers pilot survivability. The plane's also not a multi-role platform, with day-night all-weather capabilities. Instead, the MiG-29 is mostly a fighter that can only engage in very limited air-to-ground support. According to the Polish pilot, while the MiG-29 was a significant aircraft in its time, it's now a ghost of a bygone era. The F-16, meanwhile, is entirely designed for efficiency, and with modern upgrades has outpaced its old Cold War rival. It's hard to get a better endorsement than from a pilot who spent five years flying each airframe, and the overall consensus is the same. The MiG-29 is well past its prime, and it was never really a particularly good dogfighter anyway. The jet was much better suited for taking out bombers and other support aircraft before gunning it home as fast as possible. Ultimately, though, just how well Ukraine's F-16s perform against Russia's fleet of MiG-29s will depend on numbers, because even an inferior jet can win the day with enough support. Despite the Russian aerospace forces making a very weak showing in the war so far, they have numbers on their side. An intercepting flight of F-16s could easily be harassed at long range by superior numbers, forcing them to go on the defensive and allowing the MiG-29s to close in for the kill. This is why how Ukraine uses its F-16s matters, at least until the West makes good on Ukraine's request for 100 of the combat aircraft. With an estimated two dozen F-16s by early 2024, Ukraine is unlikely to use them for air interceptions, relying instead on ground-based air defenses for that job. Simply put, until its numbers go way up, Ukraine can't risk being outmanned in the sky. But the F-16 opens up a whole list of possibilities for Ukraine. First, unless its ability to network with NATO data links is removed before being transferred, Ukrainian F-16s will be able to directly plug into NATO AWACS and other platforms. This will give the aircraft incredible battlefield awareness, unsurpassed by the Russians. With a constant flight of AWACS platforms along Ukraine's borders and in the Black Sea, NATO has been able to monitor nearly all the airspace inside the country and provide ample warning to Ukrainian pilots. NATO personnel have even confirmed they've directly fed intelligence to Ukrainian aircraft, which led to air-to-air -air kills. The big question, though, is if NATO will allow the incoming F-16s to keep their ability to network directly with NATO platforms. On one hand, this will make NATO a direct participant in the war in a brand new, more worrisome capacity. NATO platforms could literally guide NATO weapons fired by Ukrainian pilots in NATO planes to their targets. This is a significant step that NATO might not be comfortable taking. On the other hand, though, fuck Russia. The F-16 also throws the door wide open on those types of weapons that Ukraine will be able to employ against the Russian forces. To date, a significant inventory of long-range weapons have been unavailable to Ukraine because of a lack of launch platforms. The F-16 is built to carry any weapon in the NATO inventory, and its electronic brains can make maximum use of it. While American engineers pulled off a MacGyver-type fix to allow Ukrainian MiGs to fly with American harm missiles, the Ukrainians were unable to make use of the harm's capabilities due to a lack of interfacing between the weapon and the plane. This is no longer a concern. 
Harms carried by F-16s will be able to provide their pilots with much greater data and enjoy far greater effectiveness and precision. The Ukrainians will also be able to fly a large number of party favorites, such as the wind-corrected munitions dispenser, a precision bomb that disperses a large number of bomblets over a target area. They'll also be able to employ JDAMs, which the US can supply on the cheap and in great numbers. Basically, every weapon in the US inventory suddenly becomes fair game for Ukraine. It's great. The Russians are going to have a literal blast. And ultimately, Ukraine's small F-16 fleet is probably best used to directly support ground forces rather than try to achieve air superiority. Until a nation has a significant number of Falcons, the aircraft is best used to deliver a devil's cocktail of precision weapons directly onto Russian front lines. If Russian morale is low now, wait until precision cluster munitions begin raining from the skies in large numbers. The F-16 for Ukraine, though, is important for something else altogether. They represent a long-term commitment to the security of Ukraine. Combat aircraft require a significant logistics tail, which is being established right now for Ukraine's fighters, and this is not something that can be set up overnight night or is cheap to establish. Thus, America agreeing to the transfer of F-16 signals its commitment to support Ukraine for as long as it takes. If Putin thought he'd be able to outlast the West, he bet wrong. F-16s also will begin the process of standardizing Ukraine's military with NATO's, a significant step forward to actual NATO membership. The US is looking to the future and is setting up the groundwork that will help transform the Ukrainian military into an armed force that can be easily integrated into NATO, both for continued support and for continued security once Putin accepts his war was over the moment his forces failed to take Kyiv in three days. Now go check out why Russia is scared of F-16s in Ukraine, or click this other video instead.